Could be my sickness. Okay. Okay, I would like to call the Committee of the Whole meeting of April 2nd, 2024 to order. Good evening, everyone. My name is J.D. Patriva, Counselor and Chair of the Planning and Economic Development Committee. I would like to begin by reading a safety notice. In the event of an emergency, please evacuate council chambers to, to the nearest exit through the chamber doors and obey all instructions given. And if assistance is required, please see the deputy clerk, Devan. So we'll be following Devan in case of an emergency. Once you have evacuated the building, please gather in the front parking lot outside of town hall. I would also like to remind attendees of our code of conduct while in the council chambers pursuant to the town of Lincoln's procedural bylaw to please be respect respectful while others are speaking and thank you very much for your cooperation. Um, additionally, due to the limited capacity in the council chambers, we request that attendees exit after the agenda item if you are interested in and has been discussed in the associated motion passed to provide seating for others in attendance. Looks like we're okay. Um, should it be required? You can continue watching the remainder of the meeting on the town's YouTube channel. Further, please ensure your cell phones are on silent or turned off. I'm just checking that myself. Okay. Um, and lastly, the Town of Lincoln Committee of the Whole meetings are posted on our YouTube channel. Closed captioning is available on all of, of all our videos by selecting the closed captioning button on the bottom right of the video. Members of committee are in attendance in person and remotely with Councillor Mikuluk arriving later this evening. We have staff in attendance in person and remotely. Additionally, we have representatives from Urban Environments, Vintage Hotels, the Municipal Heritage Advisory Committee, the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority, Better Neighborhoods Incorporated, the Housing Select Committee, and Watson and Associates Economists Limited, as well as resident delegations attending. Um, are there any declarations of interest for tonight's meeting? Councillor Mikluk has declared a conflict to item 5.1, inclusive of the registered delegations, and has noted a personal residence is located within 120 meters of the proposed application. Okay, I see none, no others. Uh, do members have amendments to the order of tonight's agenda? Okay, I don't see any. So we have one statutory public meeting this evening. The purpose of the public meeting is to provide background information, receive comments from the public, and consider questions regarding the zoning bylaw amendment application. Bye. Urban environments for 3821 to 3827 Main Street, Jordan. We will consider the report associated with the item immediately after the statutory public meeting. Sections 3412 of the Planning Act requires that before passing a zoning bylaw amendment, committee must ensure that sufficient information and material is available to understand generally the proposal being considered. And committee must hold at least one public meeting for the purpose of giving the public an opportunity to make representations regarding the proposed amendments. If a person or public body does not make an oral submission at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Town of Lincoln before the zoning amendment is approved or a decision is made on the draft plan of subdivision, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of Town Council to the Ontario Land Tribunal, OLT. Personal information is collected under the authority of the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act and may be contained in an appendix to a staff report, published in the meeting agenda, delegation list, and or the minutes of the public meeting and made part of the public record. The Town of Lincoln collects the information in order to make informed decisions on the relevant issues and to notify interested parties of committee's decisions. Names and addresses contained in submitted correspondence and other information will be available to the public unless the individual expressly requests that the town to remove their personal information. The disclosure, of this, the, the disclosure of this information is governed by the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Our public meeting for the zoning bylaw amendment by Urban Environment is now called to order, and our Manager of Planning and Development will provide introductory comments for us. Uh, Ms. Coquiera, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Good evening. The zoning bylaw amendment application before you this evening has been submitted to facilitate the construction of a three to four story, 49 room boutique hotel with 54 underground parking spaces, 70 surface parking spaces, and an outdoor pool 
with site-specific zoning provisions for front and side yard setbacks and existing parking stall sizes. The proposed development is associated with the existing Inn on the 20 Hotel and Spa across the road on Main Street in Jordan. The proposed building contains only room accommodations as the patrons would utilize the existing amenities across the road, such as the restaurant, spa, and any event space. An open house, which was very well attended, was held and staff have begun gathering feedback and comments. Some things we heard to date include height and visual impact concerns, water table and stormwater concerns, construction noise and noise from patrons using the pool, noise and fumes from underground parking garage, increased foot and vehicle traffic, questions around landscaping, and reference to the shrinking village. Most of these concerns would be addressed at the detailed site plan approval stage. As a response to the visual concerns and questions, the applicants have prepared 3D modeling to show how the proposed development will look traveling down 19th Street, which is included in their presentation coming up shortly. The purpose of this meeting tonight is to hear input from the public and no decision on the application is being made tonight. After this evening, the applicants will work with staff to address any comments and staff will bring forward a recommendation report at a later date once all comments and concerns are addressed. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Monica. We have three registered delegations for this item. Please note delegations may speak for a maximum of five minutes. Once we have received the delegation, committee will transition directly into the report and the associated motion. So our first delegation for this evening is a joint delegation from Greg Hind, Urban Environments, Urban Environments, and Paul McIntyre Vintage Hotels and are part of the application. As such, I will ask that committee it will allow them to delegate as one, permitting a total delegation time of 10 minutes. I have a motion moved by Councillor Russell that committee waive the rules to allow a joint delegation and permit a maximum of 10 minutes. I will now ask our Deputy Clerk to open the vote. Uh, thank you, Chair. That vote's now open. No problem. Thank you, and I'll close that vote and that motion carries. Thank you, Chair. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much, Devan. Okay, um, so Paul and Greg, please go ahead. I guess I should state my name. <laughs> Paul McIntyre, and I live at 129 Loretta Drive, Virgil, Ontario, uh, representing um, uh, Vintage Hotels, Elias Hotels Properties, on this proposal. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, Mayor Easton, Council, and staff and community. Um, my name is Paul McIntyre, and I am the v Vice President of Operations and Development for Elias Properties Hotels. Um, our, our delegation this evening is in relation to the zoning bylaw amendment application to permit the construction of a four-story, 49-room boutique hotel, including 54 underground spaces, 70 service parking spaces with adjacent parking lot and an outdoor pool. I am accompanied by Greg Hind, Planner for Urban Environments, who will speak to the technical elements of this application. Uh, Stan from Archway Architects, who's created the architectural renderings. He is our architect. And Christophe Hermes, the general manager for End of the 20 as well, for further questions. If I may, I'd like to start with a quick overview of the renderings. That will be my part of the proposal tonight related to this property for a possible new future boutique in the village of Jordan. A few mentionables. Our proposal is, is for an additional luxury boutique style, 49 rooms, as I've mentioned. Um, and it's also been mentioned that our existing conference and dining room space can more than meet the demand of additional um, rooms for service. And we believe there is a demand for premium overnight accommodation in Lincoln. There's no additional restaurant. There's no new bar. There's no new conference amenities within this application. We understand that no decision will be made tonight and rather that the committee will hear from the community on our application and we also do welcome that. If approved, we understand that the lads are subject to site plan control and we're committed to working to work to address matters related to community feedback. 
Landscaping, buffering were all uh, comments. Parking, grading, and making sure that we work to create an overall positive impact. Um, it is our belief that this will be an evolution through communication and adjustments, and provisions will need to be made through the process, and that the process has already started from feedback from our last open house. We thank everyone for their comments. We have committed to Jordan Village and love the relationships we've built. We'd like to note that. We'd like to continue to build positively on those relationships while growing in a sustainable manner, in a manner that benefits Jordan, Lincoln, and the Niagara region. The commitment to the Jordan Village Improvement Plan was also an inspiration to invest in the Jordan Village in Lincoln. The villages traditionally successfully existed as mixed use with strong thriving commercial components integrated. We believe this project will further serve to be a great integration to this improvement plan within the community. So we are talking about um, 3823, 3827, and 3821 Main Street. Um, the proposal is for a three to four story boutique inn building facing west with no rooms facing south. It is a 49 premium room boutique hotel, all with three stories except for the five center lofts in the middle, um, which are four stories. There are 54 parking spaces and the first floor is elevated to allow for partial underground parking and an above ground lap pool. Um, just for context, this is a little bit of an older um, rendering, but it just gives you context to where the retail, cave springs, restaurant, and conference already exist. The blue and yellow is where the new hotel uh, would exist if approved, and we're in on the 20 already does exist. This is uh, west, make sure that I keep up here, west facing Main Street. We do recognize that further engagement, that the design will change and should incorporate key features, materials, and landscape. We're also more than amenable to working through the options with the town and staff. And if any neighbors wish to meet with us one-on-one -on -one or to speak to us, we're more than amenable to that. You'll find Christoph on site, on the street, and walking around the property on a regular basis for questions. This is the same, of the same side of the street, just for context, this is in on the 20. This is the partial underground parking garage with entrance on the northeast parking lot. And I'm just going through these for purposes of speed, and I do know that they're in the, in the file as well, so. This is the east side back above the garage entry where the pool, uh, lap pool will exist. Uh, just a note, it, it is not currently in our plans regarding to questions that this pool will be open past daylight at this time. It is a lap pool, and it's an amenity that will provide an extension of the spa and boutique hill ex boutique hotel experience only. It is to our guests' detriment if it creates a noisy disturbance to our guests and neighbors, and no parties are to be planned by it. It doesn't benefit us or the guests that are nearby. This is the south elevation. And based on our last um, open house, we also had um, questions for the 19th Street elevation. And I'm going to apologize. We have two. But I believe a third one will actually serve the purpose of showing um, some of the neighbor's uh, um, renderings as far as elevations as well. Um, so this is in on the 20 as it exists and the property as it would look on the 19th section in the second one. A third one will be forthcoming as well. I just wanted to speak to um, opportunities. We hope our opportunities can be realized for this proposal for the local economy, for the community and the surrounding area. Some of, some of these opportunities for us, but not limited to all, are the additional economic boost, keeping visitors spend in Lincoln. Currently, there are existing day visitors that drive to, our, to the village of Jordan on a regular basis, and we'd like to turn them into stay visitation. The partners and destination packages that could be a multiplier for many businesses, and the taxes, development, and charges and fees that come with it. The other opportunities are employment. It adds employment, talent, and drives the workforce development. It creates entry level and managerial positions, more full-time year-round opportunities as we'd like to grow this business um, more on the off season, the shoulder months. Local municipal revenues will be generated by tourism growth, which can be reinvested back into the community. And of course, there is existing demand right now for day, in day visitation for accommodations in Lincoln. A premier boutique inn would fill a demand in a controlled manner with 24 hour site supervision. And that would be our goal. I'd like to introduce Greg Hind um, to take it from here. And uh, hopefully at the end we can answer any questions. Greg? 
Thank you, Paul. Um, Madam Mayor, Mr. Chairman, members of council, our committee. Uh, my name is Greg Hine with Urban Environments, and I'm not going to repeat the excellent report in K uh, PD 10 uh, 24, which uh, was done by your staff. It goes through all the provincial policies, the local policies, and the regional policies. And uh, the only thing I'll say about them, because there's no position taken in regards to the information provided, is we've reviewed those policies. Uh, they're in our planning justification report. Uh, and mo all of those policies, each and every one that's en enshrined in that uh, report, is, is supportive of this application. Uh, the site is 1.5 acres in size, and um, the building that we're putting on is 75 by 150 in size. That's about 12,000 square feet of building. I mention that only because of what exists on that site today. Uh, there's five buildings, um, two residential, one commercial, and two warehouses. It occupies um, a square footage that um, exceeds what we're going to do in the future. So those five existing buildings occupy more land, more green space than the new hotel will will uh, will. Uh, the closer to the mic. Okay. Yeah, please. Will occupy. So more green space. Um, it only occupies 23 percent of that total site. It's a very modest hotel. Uh, in support of the application, we had 10 technical support studies done. We list those in front of you. Um, each and every one addressed a certain issue. Everything from architecture to a functional service re report to traffic to lot grading to urban design and to landscaping. All of those support studies are complete. All have recommendations in them and all support this very modest uh, hotel. Um, the landscaping portion of it is an ongoing process that uh, we hope to uh, uh, have uh, dealt with at the site plan agreement stage. Um, the subject lands have three different zoning classifications and um, they're all general commercial, central business district commercial, and residential zones. The residential zones cover the two residential buildings. The central business district zone covers the um, one building that the whole hotel uses as for two units, and the general commercial zone is site-specific that covers the parking lot. So what are we doing here? You know, we've got commercial zoning in place. Well, the official plan um, that you have in place since 2016 designates this site in a split designation which permits hotel use. That official plan determines what? The zoning bylaw will determine how it goes in. Um, but these zones are site specific, these commercial zones, they're residential, and we will, uh, we have to amend it. Um, and as far as the conformity issue, uh, the province, the region, the town provide all similar policies in this regard. They talk about com communities, uh, built form compatibility, heritage and, and cultural resources, climate change and sustainability, and efficient use of infrastructure. All of these support studies, including our planning analysis, um, indicate that uh, this is an integral part of this community. It completes the tourist node at this specific area that, that Vintage owns and operates. We know there's industrial uses there. We know there's commercial uses there. We know there are hotel uses there already. And it uh, completes that, uh, that, uh, that node of, of, uh, of, of tourism use. Um, the growth plan for the Great Year Golden Horseshoe, the growth plan, it has specific policies. It talks about cl complete communities and providing sufficient infrastructure. Our analysis for infrastructure does indicate there's plenty of capacity in all systems to service that site. 
save and except for the pumping station, the Jordan Valley Pumping Station, which will be upgraded uh, this year. And we're willing to uh, have you put, place the holding, a holding zone on it until that pumping station is complete. Once it's complete, uh, that system will be able to service, I believe, 7,000 people. Uh, with the hotel in place, 6,500 people. Uh, so there's plenty of capacity in the system, plenty of capacity in, uh, in the water and, and storm sewer system also. Regional Niagara official plan, it promotes built forms, land use patterns, and street configurations that improve community resilience and sustainability, reduce greenhouse gas and emissions, and conserve biodiversity. Uh, this uh, hits it exactly uh, that uh, all those policies do support what we have intended. Um, the Lincoln official plan, which was approved uh, and amended in 2016, as I said, the lands are designated uh, Central Business District mixed use, both of which permit, since 2016, hotel use. And all we're doing is implementing your official plan and uh, abiding by the Jordan Valley uh, design cr uh, criteria that's in that plan. Um, although it's a general guidance, uh, we've let it inform our, our design uh, we know that this pro proposed development uh, fills the need for hotel units. It stabilized the employment opportunities for Jordan and Lincoln. And we know it, the proposed development is supported by the provincial, regional, and town policies. The site specifics, um, we don't need to go into that. I've mentioned them. Uh, important one, maximum building coverage is only 23%. Uh, we have a lot of landscape uh, area at 38%. The parking spaces are interesting in that all the required parking spaces for this hotel, uh, plus five more, are underground and uh, away and abide by the Jordan Valley uh, secondary plan design guidelines. Uh, we provide a 70 surface parking also, um, which uh, in the whole area, the parking for in on the 20, the winery, um, this hotel development, we have 176 parking spaces to fulfill any of the parking requirements in this area. More than enough, and we exceed all your, uh, all your requirements in the uh, zoning bylaw and in the, uh, in the uh, secondary plans. Landscape plan, uh, the landscape plan is underway. Uh, it's been, we've had one or two iterations of it. Um, as I indicated, the hotel footprint occupies a very little uh, land in regards to only 23% lot coverage. That means there's more onus on landscaping this site to be compatible with the surrounding areas. Uh, the details of the final landscape plan will be included in the site plan agreement process. Uh, what I'd like to mention, though, is there's going to be low-profile shrubs and, uh, and trees at the front on the Main Street side along the south side, more mature deciduous and coniferous trees, and in the rear, uh, a mixture of both. Um, so um, it's at that stage, and uh, we had some good input at the open house of people wanting to participate in the uh, landscape process. Uh, they had good ideas about what they wanted to see. We've incorporated some of those ideas um, already uh, one of the main ones, they didn't want a water element running through there. Um, they thought it had a chance of overflow, stormwater management problems, and we removed it. They wanted denser vegetation against their housing to the south. We've included more mature trees, uh, and we've certainly uh, included uh, 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 more densely populated uh, uh, trees in that area. So we're proceeding. We're addressing their concerns, and we hope to participate with staff in, in getting that, uh, that landscaping uh, plan in place. Um, since your official plan does permit hotel use, uh, my concentration in the planning justification report was on a design analysis, a form fit and function analysis that we did. Uh, the form fit, it's a modest 49 room compact footprint uh, the three or four stories is enshrined in a mansard roof 
and that minimizes the impact on the south and north land uses. Uh, the building position <coughs> creates no shadowing on any neighbor. Uh, the, the shadowing is on our site. Uh, we're doing um, concrete articulated artwork by uh, local artists. Um, it will be on the main street facade and over above the underground parking entrance. Um, the mansard roof is, is, provides a nice visual interest to the public, especially over the main entrance, which is at a, at a four-story level. The building materials are in sympathy with the main street. Um, articulated entrance, glazing, metal roof are sympathetic with the surrounding building materials. The color palette hasn't been decided, but it will be uh, in sympathy with the, the public realm and the, uh, the surrounding uh, uses. Um, the hotel design respects both the residential design along Main Street, but just as importantly is the repurposed industrial site immediately across the road. If you walked out into the middle of Main Street and looked back at the winery building, it replicates exactly what we're trying to do on this site. It has a higher middle, which was the old office portion, and it has two one-story wings to it. Our building will have a four-story middle of the grand entrance and the lofts with a three, two three-story wings to it. So there's a good compatibility in regards to recognizing uh, uh, the importance of that, uh, that it played on the streetscape and that we'll blend in with it. The function of uh, this site, uh, it completes the repurposed Cave Springs Vintage Property Industrial Commercial Tourism Complex, allowing for economies of scale, complement to building design, and shared services. It addresses the need for more hotel rooms in Jordan and Lincoln. It creates more employment opportunities. It's environmentally sensitive development, keeping with the town, regional, and provincial policy direction. In regards to the materials we're using, we're using solar panels to heat and provide electricity to the whole development. Those solar panels and all the um, uh, equipment will be hidden behind a parapet that surrounds and is on top of the, uh, the building. Uh, nobody will see it. The summary of findings that uh, resulted from our planning justification report, it was consistent with the policies of uh, the provincial government, growth plan, provincial policies. It conforms with the regional Niagara official plan, conforms with the policies of the town of Lincoln. Uh, respects the criteria set out in your official plan for compatibility. Um, and the requests of zoning bylaw uh, and each site-specific provision are appropriate and, and justified. We know that that side yard works. We know that that front yard setback works from accessing that uh, from a pedestrian uh, movement point of view. Uh, the redevelopment will remove three buildings that are functionally obsolete and replaced with modern, efficient development using friendly building materials. Um, live properties and vintage inns are experienced hotel developers that uh, usually develop in a mixed environment, usually within a residential neighborhood. I've been on both sides of the equation in regards to uh, seeing that in Niagara on the Lake, and they've done an excellent job there, and an excellent job in Jordan, too. Site services are uh, through uh, existing sanitary sewer water and stormwater networks. They're in place for us. Um, the new hotel development uh, certainly exhibits a high degree of urban design that benefits the streetscape and is appropriate in this urban context. The design and placement uh, of hotel aligns with good urban design guidelines in regard to form, fit, and function, as outlined in the design guidelines for the Villa Ridge Jordan and also in our planning justification report that we've submitted to you. And those are my comments, and we're certainly open to any questions you may have. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Paul and Greg. Uh, any questions of the delegation? Councillor Murray. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, through you to our presenters, Paul, Greg, nice to see you here. Um, we talked about parking a little bit, and you did answer one of my questions, so thank you. Parking is always a question that gets asked. Um, I've been downtown Jordan uh, when there's an event going on, and your parking lot is used not just for your events, is what I've noticed. So your total spots now are going to be 176, right? So the new spots that you're referencing here, the 54 and the 70, are in addition to what's currently there. 
Is that correct? No. They're the, not? No, the 54 are underground. Yeah. And they will build, be built, of course, where the hotel is built. Uh, there's about 65 or 66 in the existing parking lot. We consider that a very, very important land use element along the whole Main Street. As you said, many other people use it besides our hotel guests. Uh, we're adding 11 additional parking spots to the surface. We're adding five or six more parking spots to the required um, underground parking. And there are another, the rest are in association with parking lots on either side of in on the 20. They exist today. And the other parking spots, I believe there's 15, are associated with the industrial use of the winery. Total one. Which is across the street? Yes. Uh, so, so clarifying question, if I may. So then we're looking at 65 additional spots to what's already there now. No, yes. Yes. So... Um, and, and as stated, parking is at a premium. Um, do you guys anticipate at any point that this will become limited parking in that, I mean, that only you're only allowed to park there if you're either at the spa or at the hotel? Or are you anticipating that people are going to be parking there to be shopping down the street and going down to the plaza at the far end? Or what's your vision for how this parking spot place is going to be used with the rest of the community? We may have two different visions. <laughs> <laughs> my, my vision is it's such an important component of the whole main street and that it should be open to the general public, not just the patrons, okay? And we've taken that into account. We had a traffic study done that uh, took a look at the parking, the capacity, and the, the operational function of that parking lot and indicated that it functions at, a, at an adequate <coughs> level uh, and they modeled what they would anticipate with the impact of the hotel on the parking site, and they were quite satisfied that it met, met the uh, demand or the future demand. Um, if you don't mind. Yeah. And just to add to that, one of the things I did mention is that we do have already currently existing in, in the town of Lincoln and Jordan Village a, a significant amount of day visitation. Ultimately, what we want to do is we want to turn that into day visitation. So they're already here, they're driving here, they've already landed in our parking lot, but then they're leaving. And ultimately, what we want to do is to have them come and stay. So as far as the impact, there, there will be some impact, but I don't think it's, it's as great because we're adding just rooms and not all the extra amenities as they already exist. Um, there may need to be some provisions as to how we operate as we start to learn um, going down the road, whether it's shuttle services to and from wherever we need to go. A lot of our market is wedding driven, so they are off-site and then we bring them back. Um, but there's also the functionality of, of the, the parking lot that uh, has just been renovated by the fire department that needs utilization. And if that's staff parking, those provisions that will make this flow a lot easier, I think, need to be considered operationally and need to be considered in that area. But again, I think the biggest focus is, is taking those guests that are leaving Lincoln and that are already parked there and, and, and just turning them into to guests that stay overnight. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Murray. Councillor Russell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to the presenters. Um, again, thank you very much for uh, the update and the information tonight. Um, I think you have done a, a good job at uh, um, taking what was brought forward in uh, the open house in the last presentation, uh, some of that feedback, and, and changing it uh, to update it with the site plan. Um, my question is, we did receive a lot of feedback and concern about the inconvenience um, during the, the, again, if this were to go through, during the construction process. So I'm um, just to the residents around, I'm just wondering, what do you believe or what do you think would be a forecast of timelines of, if this were to go forward, of when shovels would be in the ground uh, to start and when uh, you're cutting the ribbon to finish, just to give everybody kind of a timeline of what that inconvenience might be. I'm going to lean back on Greg. He said I could do this, but I think one of the provisions we need to consider is that the pump house needs to be done. So that's going to extend the time from when we would start um, also. So uh, that'll need to be a provision within, within our start. I also think that the design and the process will take some time. So I think we are years away from a shovel in the ground, I would, I would be inclined to say. How many? Um, uh, yeah. Sorry, say that again? I was going to say 2026. 2026. I think everybody needs 
also right now maybe a little bit of a break. I do, I do understand what they've been experienced. I think it's for the better of good long term, but it's difficult, I imagine. But okay. And to clarify, so 2026 would be the start of the project, potentially? Well, we're waiting. In front of the yeah, I'm sorry. We're, wait, we're, we're waiting for the region to do the pumping station. Um, supposedly, they were supposed to call tenders in 2023. They haven't yet. Um, so we're going to get started sometime, hopefully in 2024, with a completion date in 2025. That's the only time we can move, is 2025. I expect an 18-month eight, an build-out of that hotel. Okay, and that's, that's what I was, I was looking for, yeah. that 18-month timeline to kind yeah. of figure out what potentially that uh, inconvenience time frame might be. And then, uh, again, it's probably way too early to get into details about what kind of mitigation steps you might be able to take to offset some of those concerns. But, uh, again, if this were to go through, maybe we can deal with those. Uh, I, I think we did make a commitment that uh, the streetscape will not change until we get all our approvals and are ready with a building permit to you. What I mean by that is we're not going to demolish the existing buildings as you see them today. We're still going to maintain them. We're still going to keep them up. We're still going to make sure they're an important part of the streetscape. But when we, su when we submit that building permit, they'll come down, of course. Um, that will minimize the construction time frame because as soon as they come down, we're going to put a shovel in the ground to start construction. Um, we know it's going to be... Um, According to our architect, the construction time may be reduced uh, and the noise factor may be reduced in regards to the type of construction this building is being made of. It's a, it's a core slab, prefab concrete that will be placed in instead of the noisy mixing of the concrete and digging and mixing of the concrete and pouring. Uh, much, reduc much reduced building time frame. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Hind and Mr. McIntyre. I see no, no further questions. So thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Guys, I see one remotely. So can Councillor Timmers, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Chair Pachariva. Sorry for my delay. I am a bit delayed from my location. Um, thank you to the present presentation. And I just had a question around the outdoor pool. I know that our outdoor pools can be noisy and can disturb, you know, neighboring properties. Um, you had said in your presentation that there would be a time frame, uh, no evening use of the pool. Um, I'm just wondering how we ensure that, that it continues on without parties happening at the pool, or if there's some kind of a screening to, you know, absorb a little bit of sound. You know, I know when people are in the pool, it can be noisy. So. Just some comments on that would be appreciated. Thank you. I think one of the things that we're, we we believe and think need to happen is that there are you know opening and closing times that are that meet the needs of the community, but not only the community. It comes back to meeting the needs of our guests because there are guest rooms there. Um, we're a luxury boutique hotel. That would ideally be what we're building, and that we're we're creating an experience that kind of balances the spa, the dining, and the hotel experience. So I a provision that that it's not open past a certain time would be acceptable to us. And I think also, uh, right now, we don't have any intent to leave it open past uh, sundown. Um, the other aspect to it is also the buffering, the, is the, the landscaping and, and the trees and, and uh, the wall. But I'll let Greg talk to that section of it. That is important to it. But I think when it's open and us managing it as responsible community members um, is important. We, we don't want to create anything where we're getting calls at 12 o'clock at night because Christoph won't like that. Um, and we don't want to upset our guests and we don't want to be dealing in a negative manner with our, with our neighbors. It's just certainly, it, it's not a healthy relationship and a way to exist uh, as, a, as an operator. So um, specifically to the, the other section of it, I'll let Greg speak to that. The, um as I indicated, we had already started the uh, landscaping process uh, coming out of the open house, and that was a concern at the open house. Um, and what we've done is we've ensured that uh, the densification and the height of the landscape trees uh, will be all year round. Uh, uh, it started, we've increased the height, we've increased the, the density of the trees, at both the south boundary and against 19th Street. 
And that will also be buttressed from a noise point of view by a concrete wall, decorative concrete wall, that goes along the property line. And uh, that will hopefully stop any noise emanating during the daylight hours. Um, we know there's going to be some noise, um, but the function of that pool, too, makes a difference in how uh, noise will, will come from that area. And it's a lap pool. It's not one of these pools where there's going to be an awful lot of activity uh, in regards to playing volleyball or doing water sports. It's strictly there as a lap pool. It's strictly there as an exercise situation. And uh, we made that point perfectly clear to the, to the residents. Some of the residents uh, welcome that, especially all season. Um, and uh, we're happy to work with the staff to make sure that any noise emanating from that pool is uh, controlled by the hours of operation, the landscaping that we're providing, mature trees, all season trees. And, um, and uh, that's about as much as we can do at the same time as having that amenity there for uh, not only our guests, but the, uh, the, the community at large. Great, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair Pachariva. That's all my questions. Okay, thank you, Councilor Timmers. Oh, Mayor Easton. Okay, Mayor Easton has her hand up, obliterating her face, but go ahead, Your Worship. Can you unmute yourself, please, Mayor Easton? Thank you. All right, thank you very much, and thanks for, very much for your presentation. This is a very interesting um, project. There's no question about it. I'd like to go back. Um, either of you can answer this, and I just would like to table, since we're at this stage in the process, what your understanding is regarding some of the heritage features that were mentioned um, when we were talking about the demolition of some of the buildings. Um, how do you see that discussion carrying over into uh, more of the concrete um, design features as we go forward? As you may recall, the decision was made by staff and council um, to grant a demolition permit to 321, which was the only building in that area that uh, was being looked at as a candidate for uh, a Part 4 designation. Uh, we had a number of studies done, the one being a heritage impact assessment of the building itself, a heritage impact assessment of the, the, the site and the area. And we had a, a functional engineering report done on identifying the stages that that building uh, took shape. It may have started out as a, a very plain building back in the late 1880s, but parts were added um, right up until 1950 to 1970, in fact, I think. Certain parts of that building were added. It proved to be that it wasn't the heritage site or the heritage building that a lot of us anticipated. Um, but having said that, there were some interesting elements and we, we, number one, we are going to measure the building. We're going to make sure that the measurements of that building are in place, either at the museum, at the municipal offices, but they're there. We're also going to identify with your staff any architectural elements that are worth saving during the demolition so that we can preserve them once again at the municipality, at the museum, or incorporated into the design of the building. Um, we won't know that until we do a detailed analysis and we start the measurements of that, that site. Uh, but certainly, we're going to do everything in our power to preserve the, uh, the heritage elements, if there are any, worth preserving. And we're certainly committed to making sure they're incorporated into our design. Okay, that's fair, and, and I appreciate the repetitive nature of this question, but as we move along, I think it's a good idea for us to be absolutely clear that um, there really wasn't much there. As you noted, uh, we, were, we were certainly looking for more. It appeared that there would be more, 
but um, but it just sometimes it just doesn't uh, follow through, and uh, that was the case with this building. However, there are there are some rather charming pieces, and let's hope that there's uh, some uh, places where they can be appropriately placed. I quite like the mansard roof. I I, I really feel that the design. It really seems to suit that area well. So it could be that those um, those heritage pieces, those pieces of bric-a-brac, whatever they are that are part of that house now, may not be suitable. But anyway, I'll leave that to you. I think it's good to have this fully documented so there isn't any question of what the intentions um, have been from the outset. Thanks very much for that. And thanks for your presentation. Thank you, Mary Easton. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chairman. Okay. I see no further questions. Thank you very much, Paul and Greg. Thank you. Okay. Um, our next delegation this evening is Marilyn and Dan Rowe. Okay, and it was my understanding that Dan was going to come on remotely, but he's been unable to, Marilyn, so. Okay, so it's, it's your show. It's you. Okay, you can do it. He's no good anyway. Okay. Um, all right, yeah, so my name is Marilyn Rowe. Um, my husband Dan and I are residents in the village. Um, we are in the house directly adjacent to the proposed hotel on the south side. <laughs> So um, we acknowledge that this building is, you know, it's good for the community, understand how it's going to help our local businesses and all that, um, especially the wineries in our neighborhood. So we want to support them. Um, that said, we're going to be living right next door to it. So uh, we do have some key concerns. A lot of them have been talked about already, so forgive my redundancy, um, but uh, want to mention them anyway. So of course, noise is, is a concern. With a facility this big, um, an underground parking garage, there's going to be industrial size HVAC and ventilation systems. We're sort of concerned about a, a constant hum that may arise from, uh, from those uh, utilities. And again, just mentioned about the pool noise or any other outdoor gatherings and what that might do to uh, impact the quiet of the street. The second, is, second theme is around lighting. So, 19th Street is already excessively very lit up and shines directly into the neighbors' homes um, or residents' homes. And while we understand that there needs to be outdoor lighting for the hotel for safety reasons and so forth, um, we just ask that we try to minimize the light pollution in, uh, in Jordan Village. Um, I think that really entails you know, the lighting for the stairwell, the pool, um, any outdoor gathering areas. And of course, I'm speaking more from the 19th Street perspective. Talked a lot already around traffic and parking. Um, so the traffic assessment, because it was done during the construction, it didn't really provide a lot of meaningful data. I think it's safe to assume that it's going to be busier than it is today. Um, that it can't not be. So you know, we obviously have concerns around that, around the foot traffic and the um, road traffic, the additional noise that brings to the community as well. Uh, not sure what measures can be taken. Maybe it's just more better enforcement of the 40 kilometer speed limit. Something like that would be helpful. Talked a lot about parking already as well, um, and I appreciate all the responses so far. Um, the the parking lot today is typically full on a regular basis, uh, and in the summertime, so are the road parking spots on both 19th and Main Street, and uh, leaves a little room for any visitors to come to our house and park on the street, so that's a concern. Um, I guess a question I put forth is, you know, there was a mention of using the fire hall parking, which is great. What about the Jordan House as well, there's a, a significant parking lot there too that could be helpful not only to the community but also the businesses down at that end of the street. You guys covered a lot of things already. Uh, lastly is again, the for us personally, it's the privacy um, to our lot, but um, in general it's the, the landscaping. So the elevation of the gardens and the pool actually puts people in that backyard of the hotel four feet up, which really means they can look directly into our backyard. And 
Conversely, we can look directly into theirs if we're on our, our deck. Um, so from a privacy perspective, we talked a lot about the landscaping, and I know that they've invited us to that conversation, so I appreciate that and look forward to continue doing that. <laughs> um, lastly, um, so we talked about the pool hours and so forth, and I, I guess I do have a question around security and if there would be any kind of enforced security for the hotel just to make sure nobody's loitering in the pool, loitering around, um, that kind of thing. Those are my concerns. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Any questions of the delegation? I see none. Thank you very much. Um, our next delegation this evening uh, with respect to this public meeting is Brooke Johnson. Hopefully, this door stays on. Okay. Um, I'm Brooke Johnston. I'm a resident of a Main Street in Jordan. And I'm sure there are going to be lots of uh, differing opinions tonight. But I think one thing we can all agree on is Jordan is a beautiful, historic town that is a one-of-a-kind community. And it's so great to see so many of my neighbors here tonight, um, so many familiar faces in their room. They're here supporting this because they recognize what a special place we have. I think this is why tourists like coming here. I think for my family and neighbors, we like having the tourists. It adds something for us. I also believe that tourism needs to grow, and there are a lot of smart opportunities to make this happen. But I have to question whether tearing down beautiful historical buildings and then building a four-story hotel in the style of what one councillor called a French chateau is the correct way to go forward. It certainly is for vintage hotels and their shareholders and their billionaire owner who lives in Hong Kong to make money, but is this the right way forward to respect the history of our little village of Jordan? If vintage hotels presented us with architectural plans for a hotel in the Georgian style using materials like antique brick, this might be a little bit more palatable to me. This would be in keeping with the mid-1800s architecture of our town, and the new hotel would be in harmony with surrounding buildings. But instead, we have this French chateau, mon dieu. Why are we building a French chateau in the middle of Jordan? We have a, history, we have a museum that's respecting our community, and we're building this thing that is completely irrelevant to anything else that's there. You want to have tourism? Great. So let's do something with some vision and class that will attract a high-level, switched-on tourist who spends money and wants a quaint, authentic country vibe. This, in the long run, will give so much more than this Disneyland French chateau. And I say Disneyland because, yes, you can guarantee it is going to look cheap. I spoke to the manager of On the 20 and the architect, and to appease me on the noise and construction, they said it'll be really fast because it's prefab. Prefab? That means cheap. They said they made the chateau style because the fourth story will accommodate the fans and noisy things. You know, that's not my problem. That's not the town's problem. Make it something that is respecting our history and not overpowering our town figure it out. Now, this is going to be harsh, but I do oppose this because it is vintage hotels. If this was, say, the Four Seasons, I would probably be up for it, but I do not trust them to be making decisions that encroach on our special community. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're going to say, now, Brooke, like, they have a wonderful reputation for luxury service. Well, has anyone actually stayed there? Because I have. And I want to, like, tell you, um, like, I've traveled the world, I've been to 65 countries, I've stayed in some of the most beautiful hotels in the world and also backpacker hostels. And my husband and I can say, like, ranking, that their hotel rooms and facilities do not rank highly in our opinion. I stayed at Queen's Landing, and the mattress, like, before you even laid in it, actually, like, dipped down like this. The um, handle on the bathroom door was, like, completely worn out with, like, um, you know, when the metal like, goes away and it's actually rusted, there was rust coming from the bathroom. Prince of Wales, beautiful hotel. The interior is shocking. It's so dated and awful. Um, I've been to Pillar and Post Spa. It was very dated. The pool was like a, a Holiday Inn pool. <laughs> um, it's dirty. Um, 
I think like, they also I don't trust their, their choices. They blasted Queen's Landing when I was there with this blue light that made it look like a discotheque from Lundy's Lane. Um, they painted in our village the door of a beautiful historic uh, building, a bright orange, just to make it so um, the, it is more visible to their guests. But it's the most ugly color of orange that's not fitting with the history. Now, the, I think the reason why it's so bad is they have a monopoly. What's the incentive to offer anything better when they can charge 600 a night for the equivalent room of what I would call my experience at Queen's Landing, like a West Virginia motel? It's, t it's telling that none of their hotels are five star. They trade off the history of their elegant properties and historical towns without adding value. They give the illusion of something posh when in reality it's a motel room with a concierge. They do this because they bought up everything, so they can. Um, I stayed at Shaw, I went to Shaw Cafe with my best friend who was visiting from England and uh, the food was terrible. It was dated and it was dirty. He said, why did you bring me here? And I said, I'm sorry, I th thought it was vintage hotels and it would be nice. You know, let's not make the same mistake in 20 years where we look at this dated cheap monstrosity of a French chateau and say, I thought this was vintage hotels and it would be nice. Yes, we need tourism, yes, we need hotel rooms, but let's have some vision and respect our special history because it's something we can never get back. Now, that I was listening to what they were saying here and that beautiful um, building, especially the yellow one and the barn are gonna be torn down. Now, I feel a little bit gaslit because they're saying like, oh, it's not, it's not history. We did all this work and it's not a historical um, classification. But the fact that it was done, this study was done, shows us that there is something of value there. And this is something we're never gonna get back. We're gonna tear down our history for a mediocre hotel in a parking lot. Please don't do this. Have some vision, have some, I don't know, thought about what should go there, please. Um, I'm also a mother with a young child, and um, of course there is big concerns about what's gonna happen when we have more hotel rooms added than we actually have houses in the community. Um, thank you, I think that's all. Um, I'm sorry that's harsh, but I do have to call out them on their business model because as a customer, I haven't been impressed and I want them not to expand into our community. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Any questions to the delegation? Okay, I see none, thank you. Um, there being no further registered delegates, are there any persons present wishing to address committee regarding the zoning bylaw amendment application by urban environments for 3821 to 3827 Main Street, Jordan. Uh, please come forward and state your name, spelling your surname for the record. Okay. Okay, are there any persons present that would like to speak to the report with respect to 3821 3827 Main Street, Jordan. Okay. I see no further delegations or anyone wanting to speak. So, statutory, statutory public meeting on this topic is now ended and adjourned. Thank you. So there being no further delegations or information on this item, I have a motion moved by Councilor Murray. The committee receive and file for information the following delegations regarding the zoning bylaw amendment application by Urban Environments for 3821 to 3827 Main Street, Jordan, Greg Hind, Urban Environments, and Paul McIntyre, Vintage Hotels, uh, Marilyn Rowe, and Brooke Johnson. I will now ask our deputy clerk to open the vote. Thank you, Chair. That vote's now open. And Mayor Easton, may I have your vote, please? Mayor Easton, you're on mute. I can't Sorry. hear you. Do you want me to do it verbally? Yes. Yes, thank you. You are in support to receive the delegations. Thank you. Thank you. And Chair, I'm closing that vote and that motion carries. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Devan. Um, 
We will now move directly into report PD 10 24 regarding the zoning bylaw amendment application by Urban Environments for 3821 to 3827 Main Street, Jordan, PD 10 24. Are there any questions from committee to staff? Okay, there being no further questions. Oh, sorry, I was looking up. Sorry. Okay, sorry, no worries, Devan. I have a motion moved by Council Renshima. That committee receive and file for inf information report PD 10 24 regarding zoning bylaw amendment application PLZBA 2024027 in the name of LHPH Limited, Lay Hotel Properties Limited for information, and direct staff to prepare a recommendation report once all the comments have been received and any identified issues have been addressed. I will now ask our deputy clerk to open the vote. Thank you, Chair. That vote is now open. And Mayor Easton, may I please have your vote? Support. Thank you. And I'll close that vote. And that motion carries. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Devan. So would we want to invite Councillor Mikuluk yes. to join us? Okay. So we have no consent agenda, agenda items this evening. Uh, we're now at the planning and economic development portion of tonight's agenda. We have four registered delegations for the planning and economic development agenda. Please note that the delegations have up to five minutes to speak. Additionally, committee will consider the associated reports once the delegations have been received. Our first two delegations for this evening are speaking to item 7.2.1, section 29, part four, notice of intention to designate Balls Falls Conservation Area, PD 12-24. The first delegation this evening is Scott Foster, Chair of the Municipal Heritage Advisory Committee. Welcome, Scott. Please go ahead when you're ready. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, once again, just for anybody who doesn't know me, um, I'm Scott Foster. I'm the Chair of the Heritage Committee uh, for the Town of Lincoln. Um, and we're looking at the Balls Falls designation report. Uh, just to, it's a long report, uh, as you might have noticed when you were looking at it, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, uh, but just some of the really key important things that I just wanna point out just for how important this site is to the history of our town. Uh, the grist mill uh, in the War of 1812 was used uh, by the British um, to supply flour to everybody. Um, so very important. There's a lot of, I think I even included it in the report, the Americans were a uh, little upset that they couldn't take the mill uh, from the British. Um, but the Ball family itself is one of the, uh, is pretty much fundamental to the history of our town. It was, uh, our committee has gone through with all of the changes in the provincial legislation. We've actually targeted about 20 to 28, I forget exactly the exact number, uh, but properties of high importance as well. Um, and Balls Falls is one of those 28 in our, what we were calling tier one properties uh, to look for delegation as well too, or, or not for delegation, but for designation. Um, and so it is fundamental basically to our town's history, to this, or to how Places like Vineland and Jordan started to pop up because it was an industrial hub in the area and the Ball family was important in lots of different areas, including the starting point for fundamental people in our town as well, too. So it's just a very quick, <laughs> I didn't, like I said, I've made you guys suffer through reading a lot already. Um, but, uh, and I just want to say on behalf of our committee that we're, just so excited that you're looking at this one as well, too. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Scott. And uh, you know what, your your report was fantastic. I love reading it, especially the different types of shales of the uh, of the falls. Brought me back to my uh, geology uh, days at university. So, and and I mean, all of the reports that uh, your committee puts it forward are very very thorough, and it's and it's great to get a snapshot of the history. Right, so you, you learn about the future from your connection to the past. So appreciate all the work you put into that. So any questions to Scott? Okay, Councillor Timmers. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Pachariva. Through you to Scott, um, Chair of the Heritage Committee. Scott, huge thank you for all the work that you did on this report. 
as the committee can tell, it's an incredible amount of work that goes into designating a property. It's not a simple process by any means. It, in, it includes a lot of research and a lot of work. And Scott, you just did an outstanding job putting this together. So I just wanted to also mention that yes, the Heritage Committee did create a prior, priority one list of about 28 properties that we felt were pro possibly at risk. And those are the ones that we are focusing on at this point to designate. So I just wanted to highlight that for committee. But once again, thank you, Scott, very much. Excellent, excellent report. Thank you, Chair Pachariva. Thank you, Councillor Timmers. Uh, Your Worship, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Scott. This was certainly um, quite a substantial piece of work that you did. Um, I was sallying along here reading, and then all of a sudden on page um, 22, I got to the grist mill and then went to the fruit drying shed. And then there were all these buildings that um, that uh, were, were being frowned on. And I thought, oh my goodness, what percentage has to be yes before you, can, you can't really go ahead with the designation? So just and so that's just a theoretical question because I certainly understand, you know, you, you've added lots of details, no question about it. But um, there are some, uh, you know, like the smokehouse, uh, the lime kiln, for example, I always found that very, very um, fascinating. But just technically, what what does it mean when you have a, a property like this and um, and you're, you know, you're going to make a decision, you made a recommendation to us that there's enough there to go forward? How do you decide what is enough? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's one of those things that as our committee, we were taking a look at especially properties as part of like that tier one. We had it was a little tricky at some points, but as we were looking through the different properties, it's the history, the architecture, it's um, and just like the cultural impact. And with Balls Falls, it has all of those things. The grist mill, there really isn't very many grist mills anymore because they all burned down um, or pretty much all burned down. Uh, and so it's especially that building itself is unique. The ball home, unique. Cabins also unique in our area as well too. The history of the family is, like I said, fundamental to the creation of early Lincoln, I would say, because it was an industrial hub that was supplying even England with flour and uh, and all sorts of other materials as well too, especially lime from the lime kiln. Um, and then on top of all of that, there's also the cultural impact of it as well, too, that even to this day, it's still being used as a tourism hub with all of their events, including the Thanksgiving festival and everything like that. So I know, especially with Balls Falls, it kind of hit every single point that we wanted. And it's why we wanted to look at that property as well, too, just because it was one of those things that seemed to check off every single box as soon as we were looking at it as well. And also, okay. I mean, it was fundamental to the whole town, and we want to make sure that we're also getting those properties as well, too, because without properties like Balls Falls, we can't tell the history of the town of Lincoln. Right. Does it matter that, um, I mean, the Ball family, are there's still significant members of the, um, the descendants of the Ball family in the community. Does that add any weight to the decision? Um, not necessarily to me. Like I said, it's more of the fundamental nature of the actual Ball family that was there and everything that they were doing and all of the importance of the the village of Glen Elgin that never was. So. Right, right. And the drawings from Glen El Elgin, even though it didn't <clears throat> realize um, the future that they, the economic future that they hoped, is that included as well in in the documents that you're preserving here? Uh, yeah, I have one of the copies of, I think it's from Balls Falls itself, but it does have a little um, breakdown of what they thought the town was going to look like, including all of the 
properties that they were looking to sever back in the day to build all sorts of houses that never really ended up going. And even when you go on the trails and things today, you can see remnants of it, including even uh, old uh, hand pumping stations and things that are on the trail itself. Hmm, interesting. Well, thank you very much. This is uh, certainly pleased to have this coming forward at this early stage. Thank you very much, and thanks very much to the committee. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thanks. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, thank you very much, Scott. And, and I thought it was uh, quite interesting, too, that uh, Sir Isaac Brock's, Brock's uh, hat ended up at Balls Falls. So a yeah. little piece of interesting trivia, yeah. except after the fact that he was killed on the battlefield. Placement hat yes. is what it was supposed to be. But. <laughs> okay, excellent. So I see no further questions, so thank you very much. Um, our next delegation this evening is Adam Christie of the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority. Oh, Adam's a road. Okay, Adam, please go ahead. Good evening, everybody. No, I just wanted to take this time to thank Scott for all of the work he did on this. Um, it's been a great uh experience being able to collaborate with him and, and work with him and, and, the, and Monica with the town and the MPCA is uh, really supportive of uh, having this designation. I also really wanted to thank the Heritage Committee for, for looking at the recommendations we brought back and working with us to make sure both parties uh, uh, really made this work out. And uh, so yeah, we're really excited and I just wanted to say thanks again. So uh, yeah, that's it for me. Okay, thank you, Adam. Any questions to Adam? Councillor McLuck. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Patrick. If I threw you to Adam, um, I'm just curious with respect to the um, the property itself. There's currently there's the uh, heritage buildings that are located within that area, and there's also the newer building that's up top over the hill. Is there any plans for any future sort of newer type construction? Through you, Chair, uh, we, we do plan on on relaunching Balls Falls Master Plan. Well, hopefully within the next couple of years. But at this point, there's nothing planned for any something uh, new. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor McLuck, and I'd like to recognize our regional councillor Foster, who's here this evening, who is also the chair of the NPCA. So thank you, Robert, for being in attendance. So I see no further questions to the delegation, so I have a motion moved by Councillor Brene. That committee receive and file for information the following delegations regarding section 29 part 4 notice of intention to designate Balls Falls Conservation Area, Scott Foster Municipal Heritage Advisory Committee and Adam Christie Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority. I will now ask our deputy clerk to open the vote. Thank you chair that vote's now open. Mayor Easton. Support. Thank you. And I'll close that vote. And that motion carries. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Devan. Uh, we will now consider the associated report, item 7.2.1 PD 12-24 regarding section 29, part four, notice of intent, intention to designate Balls Falls Conservation Area. The manager of planning and development will provide into introductory comments. Uh, Monica, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, really have nothing further to add to Scott's presentation other than staff um, just want to thank him for all his work on this. Okay. Thank you very much. Do members of committee have any questions to staff? Councillor McLuck. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Patrick. We have a three to Monica. Um, just just asking, a, uh, asking a technical question with respect to designating a property. Um, is there any is there any uh, limitations as to what can occur on this property? Should it be designated? And I asked uh, Adam earlier if there was any plans to build any new buildings or any new structures, and uh, you know they're not sure at this time. But is there would there be any um, consequences, be it positive or negative, uh, with this sort of designation? Thank you for that question, through you, Chair. Um, so any new development on the property would go through the Heritage Committee. Um, they can construct new development. There's nothing stopping them from, from um, constructing any new buildings. Um, but it would go through the Heritage Committee for review. Um, as well, like, and if they, 
any of the buildings that um, have the heritage attributes listed, they could um, they could restore any in any of those buildings as well. Uh, they would also have um, grants available to do some restoration work. But no, there would be no limitations on any new construction. Okay, so through you, just just to clarify, so any any new sort of um, uh, plans for use of property, or you know, be a construction or that sort of thing, would go through the Heritage Committee for review and for consideration. Correct. Thank you. And uh, Monica, wasn't there? Didn't I read something? Wasn't there a notation in in I don't know if it was Scott's report or staff's report about replacement windows that they asked that they be wood in keeping with the with the age of the building and and, and um, you know the the uniqueness of that. I think that was a was a notification. Yes. Um, yes. So the um, the heritage committee asked that any replacement windows be wood, but if it's not possible, provide justification as to why they can't be wood. Okay. Councilor Reimer. Thank you, Chair Patriva. Uh, thank you also to Scott and to Adam for presenting to a committee tonight. Thank you. Um, I had two questions, and the first one has already been answered. Uh, Council Micklick beat me to it. Um, but also uh, through you, Chair, to, uh, to Monica, I realize that um, um, this is the first, I'm assuming, of many of these types of reports, and that, uh, and that Bill 23 has placed different implications and urgencies as far as policies and timelines, that kind of thing. Um, and perhaps my question is, it is related, I'm, I'm assuming there won't be this many, as, as my view, designations to a property as, as we'll see in the future, but the NEC already has this property designated uh, and under their escarpment protection area. They've also designated it under their NEC parks and open space system. MPCA has it under their conservation area, obviously, Balls Falls, and also it's part of their MPCA regulation lands. So. The question, and maybe it's more curiosity than anything, how many times can we designate a piece of property? So we have, so now we're, we're, we're and, I, and I, I'm, I'm in favor of, of designating it, so I, I don't want get to get me wrong, but, but this property now under Section 29, we're going to designate it under the Ontario Heritage Act. But do these, do these different things, do they supersede each other? Do they, uh, does one over, like, overrule the other, or how do they fit together? I know they're not exactly apples to apples, but the core of each of those designations is, is protection. So just looking for insight, how they work together if they don't. Through you to uh, Monica. Yeah, through you, Chair. Um, good question. So this would be a, a municipal designation. Um, they, they would all work hand in hand. I wouldn't say that one supersedes another. Um, and it is ultimately for the same reason to, for the protection of, of the, um, the historical buildings on the property. I don't know if, if Matt, you have anything to add. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, not really, just basically dovetailing off of that, that really the intent of this is to recognize a little bit more of the uniqueness of the character of these particular buildings that are subject to the designation, the historical context, considering the Ball family and, and, and things like that. So just more, we'll call it an additional item of recognition for the property, but it doesn't necessarily, to, to Monica's point, supersede the other uh, regulatory policies that are applicable that you noted. So it's more to achieve that end, if that makes sense. Okay. So follow up, Chair Patrick, if I may. So, so then in, in following with Councillor Micklick's uh, question too, so then there's, you know, and I guess it's not our responsibility, but it, but it does go through Municipal Heritage Board. How, you know, someone wants to get a permit, do they have those five designations they have to jump through those hoops then to get to get something? Like, and we're not even talking about buildings necessarily, we're talking about land features and and different characteristics, right? So whoever the owner of the land is, through uh, you, Chair Patrick. Through you, Chair. I think, so to answer your question, yes, with respect to some of them, when you talk about some of the, you know, if it being regulated by the MPCA, there's a water course, there's a bunch of things, as you know, floodplain limits and things like that. Um, from an NEC point of view, there are limitations to what development can occur. So they would have to, any, prospective development would have to abide by uh, the Niagara Escarpment Commission's policy framework, same as any other property in the NEC. Um, with respect to this designation here, the lens that the Heritage Committee would look through would just to make sure that any changes or development on site, e even if it's permitted by the other uh, policy frameworks, um, 
recognizes and protects the character that we're recognizing through this designation. So again, not necessarily limiting, but making sure that it fits and, and looking at it under that lens. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Monica. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Reimer. So there being no further discussion, I have a motion moved by Councillor Brunet. The committee receive and file for information report PD 12-24 regarding Section 29, Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act, Notice of Intention to Designate Balls Falls Conservation Area at 3292 6th Avenue, and that staff be directed to serve the Notice of Intention to Designate attached as Appendix B for the Balls Falls Conservation Area as a property of cultural heritage value or interest following the requirements of Section 29, Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act. I will now ask your deputy clerk to open the vote. Thank you, Chair. That vote's now open. Mayor Easton, may I have your vote, please? Support. Thank you. And I'll close the vote. And that motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Demand. So we will now proceed with the remaining registered delegations pertaining to item 7.2.2. Regarding official plan amendment, zoning bylaw amendment, and draft plan of subdivision application for 4129 Hickson Street, PD 14-24, a reminder that delegations have up to five minutes to address committee. Our first delegation for this item is a joint delegation from Drew Toth, Elevate Living, and Dan Romanco, Better Neighborhoods Incorporated, and are part of the application. As such, I will ask that committee allow them to delegate as one permitting a total delegation time of 10 minutes. So I have a motion moved by Councillor Reimer that committee waive the rules to allow a joint delegation and permit a maximum of 10 minutes. I will now ask our Deputy Clerk to open the vote. Thank you, Chair. That vote's now open. Mayor Easton, may I have your vote, please? Support. Thank you. And I'll close that vote. And that motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Drew and Dan. Please go ahead. Good evening, Mayor, Chair, Councillors, staff, and public. We are pleased to be before you tonight. After much work with staff, we feel that we've arrived at a healthy management of the tension of integrating into the community uh, and bringing what's most needed here in Lincoln with a variety of housing. That being said, I'm going to pass things over to Daniel Romanko. <clears throat> Thank you, Drew. Um, so, um, first off, I'd like to uh, say that I, I, uh, we've we've reviewed the staff report, um, and uh, it was uh, it was well written, very thorough, and we're in agreement with with the uh, the conclusions and the and the conditions set out therein. Um, what I'd like to do is just kind of refresh the committee with respect to where where we are today. Um, and that includes sort of bringing you up to speed with some of the revisions and changes that have been made since our public meeting in December. So just as a refresher, um, we're proposing 160 new dwelling units. They consist of 17 single detached, 36 semi-detached, 44 townhouses, and 63 apartments. Um, we're also including a neighborhood parquet. Um, that has been uh, relocated on the site, but uh, I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so just in terms of what we heard from the public meeting, um, we heard that there's a need for housing, um, including affordable options within the neighborhood, um, that there's a, a variety of housing choices that we presented was considered to be a positive thing to, um, based on those comments. There were some concerns about drainage issues and flooding um, from the adjacent neighbors. Uh, there was, there was a, a desire to have additional park space um, in the neighborhood um, and um, that the location that was proposed um, would be better suited in a more central location and, that, and one that was um, relating better to the higher density that was proposed. Um, we heard concerns about traffic congestion on neighboring streets um, and then parking as it related to the apartment and the on-street parking provisions um, and then some compatibility concerns with respect to the apartment, um, particularly the height and uh, any and related privacy issues. So with respect to the groundwater, um, we, we took those comments and um, reported them to uh, Terra Dynamics Consulting who provided a, 
a report um, addendum letter that, that addressed those. Um, the, so the concerns were that the water table and runoff issues on the surrounding properties, um, the neighbors basically were concerned that we didn't, that, that the development would exacerbate those condition, conditions for them. Um, those off-site off water concerns included the groundwater and in one particular case, a sump pump issue. Um, essentially, the report said that the soil conditions on the property are silty clay and, and clay silt and of low permeability. Um, the development of the site is likely going to lower the groundwater infiltration and reduce the recharge of the groundwater table and the water flow to the adjacent properties. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, as part of the development practice, um, we're creating a greater permeability as a result of the development that's currently there. Um, yet all of that stormwater management will be controlled on the site in accordance with uh, best practices and those um, conditions of approval and the, that design will be approved through public works um, as part of the uh, subdivision agreement. Uh, and then specifically with respect to the issue, the sump pump issues at uh, Bush Crescent 4059, um, the, the consultant recognized that, that that property was about 75 meters south of the site um, and those issues were likely related to a historical stream. Um, would note that you know, water flows downhill um, and as the case may be, uh, that's, that's true in this case. So um, as I said, uh, any of the water on site will be controlled. Um, the park uh, that we're including has uh, been relocated to Hope Street, which is adjacent to the proposed parking, uh, apartment rather. Um, it's a little more centrally located. It's a passive type park with benches and things of that nature. And um, it's intended to be a, 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 a privately owned park space, which is a relatively new thing. Um, but it's obviously open to the general public. Um, the other thing that's worth noting here is that uh, the Ashby Drive Park is literally less than 150 meters to the east of this, and it's quite a large park that serves the broader neighborhood. Uh, traffic. <clears throat> um, there were some concerns with respect to the, the expected congestion at the intersections and that the traffic study didn't account for any new development. Um, we. Uh, first of all, need to recognize that the infill property that is here has already been anticipated, um, and that's quite evident with respect to the stubs of Bush Crescent, Edward Street, along with Ashby Drive. Um, so, I mean, you know, that's part of the uh, anticipated traffic volumes. Um, the conclusions of the TIS, or the traffic impact study, was that uh, there's no anticipated uh, traffic issues that are projected, um, that the expected level of service would be, road would remain good um, as far as that's concerned. I'll just turn it over to uh, Drew to speak with, to, to the apartment site, and um, we'll follow up from there. Thank you. There were several concerns about the apartment building and uh, one of the key concerns was not enough parking. So one of the things that we did is we increased the parking ratio up to 1.19 spaces per unit to address the concern. Uh, it's important to note as well, there's 66 additional on-street parking spaces available nearby as well. And we now have visitor parking also included on site. Uh, another uh, concern was the uh, impact of view and the impact of height. And so one of the key things that we did in designing it was to center the apartment building into the middle to minimize the impact to the existing neighborhood. Um, we did actually um, have a picture, we did some thorough studies to look and see what exactly that viewpoint and what that impact would be. Um, one of the things that we have done as well is we dropped the apartment height. Originally, we were contemplating six. When the application was before you guys for the open house, it was at five. Currently, we're sitting at 
four stories. Um, I talked about this already. I'm gonna go through. Um, and one of the key things of why we want the apartment and why we're bringing the apartment to the community is the ability to bring a mix of some affordable units, some attainable units, and also some market rentals because it caters to the greatest need as you heard presented from Jeffrey Sinclair at the last presentation, which is single individuals in Lincoln and Niagara. So there's now 11% affordable units, 31% attainable, 58% market. Um, and this will be protected through a 25 year housing agreement with the town of Lincoln to ensure that it remains. So in summary, our development proposal addresses the need for a variety of housing options, including affordable and attainable. We don't expect any drainage issues or flooding. Public park space has now been moved and it's provided as a benefit not only to those of our development, but to the greater public as well. Uh, roads to maintain service level A or B, uh, also, we increased parking to address that concern and uh, uh, lowered the apartment height to four stories. So in summary, one thing that I would ask that you guys consider uh, and the neighbors as well is that when you moved to Lincoln or when you were established in Lincoln, someone had to open up and make space for you to be their neighbor. And so we're asking for the future residents on behalf of them that you guys vote yes in my backyard for who the future residents will be uh, here in the town of Lincoln through this development. Thank you and we're ready to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you very much Drew and Dan. Councillor Brené. Uh, thank you Councillor Pachariba and thank you uh, gentlemen for the presentation. So I have a couple of questions on slide six, we talk about traffic and you say that no traffic issues are expected. So I have had an opportunity to look at the 79 page document titled Burnside 4129 Hickson Street Development Transportation Study. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to um, when the traffic counts from AccuTraffic Incorporated, when that data was collected. Can you tell me when, when that was collected? Uh, thank you, Councillor Brene. Through you, Chair. Um, the data that was collected was done by our traffic engineer. Um, I'm not the traffic engineer, so I would defer that to the traffic engineer, but they're not here tonight. So, so you don't know when the data was collected? Uh, if you're referencing the regional data or the municipal data, please. Municipal. I believe it was 2019. So. So one of the data from AccuTraffic was April and September of 2021, and the regional data with regards to the uh, uh, the traffic movements of the traffic intersections and signaling signal timing plans were 2019. So I'm just I'm just trying to understand, and I know you and I have spoken about this, and I've spoken to staff, and I understand you know we have a responsibility as a region and as a municipality to make sure traffic counts are are continued to make sure they're up to date. But as we look at this application, how can we be absolutely certain to say that no traffic issues are expected when our traffic counts are three years old and our traffic signaling patterns are five years old and some of that data was collected during COVID when everybody was at home and nobody was driving? Through you, Chair. So my understanding is that they calculated a percentage increase to forecast the growth and the capacity. And I also understand that, again, I'm not a parking engineer, um, that they forecasted the increase uh, and there was nowhere close of any sort of concern of congestion. Uh, thank you, Chair. So I uh, appreciate those responses. Um, I just wanted to speak now to the slide where, uh, which is probably one of the single most um, concerns that Councillor Patrick and I have heard as um, ward councillors from the people that live up in that area. And with all due respect, um, sir, you speak with regards to one location where there's a sump pump 
as if this is an isolated case. I can assure you that's not an isolated case. There are many sump pumps up running up there. So I really, I'm really struggling when you, when you speak about this and minimize this as if it's an isolated case because it's not an isolated case. All that said, I appreciate all the work that's been done hiring this hydraulic, uh, hydrology report uh, from Terra Dynamics Consulting. Um, and you know, you, you mentioned uh, the development would exasperate the problem. Those were your words. What happens if it doesn't? So I guess my question to you is, will you have pre-construction studies uh, done for some of those residents up there in terms of uh, vibration, in terms of you know, issues to uh, existing uh, basements? We've had that in other developments, and I'm wondering if you're considering that as we move forward. Thank you for your count, uh, question, Councillor Brene. Through you, Mr. Chair. As a standard protis, uh, protocol of best practices, we do pre-construction surveys. Just helps clar clarify the issue before constructing for everyone. Through you, Chair. So I just I just have one other uh, comment. Maybe you're not in a position to uh, uh, to answer it, but um, so the hydrology re report was done by a. A certified engineer, is that correct? It's a hydrologist. I believe he is an engineer as well. We can get his exact certification and, and history for you if you prefer. Um, we've hired him to do many different hydrological studies. He's not the only guy as well, but if you would like his uh, credentials, I can provide them to you. N not necessary. I'm, I'm sure that he is qualified. I just want to, from, from your experience with Better Neighborhoods, um, hydraulic re reports, uh, are they bound by certification with the design work um, in terms of the technical stamp drawings in case there is a problem moving forward? Are they bound by, by the province in terms of their certification? Um, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, uh, just to go back and answer your other question or your comment earlier, um, we responded to the sump pump issues that were, were noted um, with respect to the comments, the written comments that were provided. Um, the, we, we didn't discount the fact that there were other sump pump issues in the, in the, in the neighborhood. Um, but with respect to the hydrologist, yes, I understand he is a, a PN. He is bound by the Code of Ethics as, as, for, as a PN to provide comments in his area of expertise, which in this case is hydrology. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Brene. Councillor Russell. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to the presenters, um, this is kind of a question that goes a little bit to the report, but also to your presentation. So um, of the affordable and obtainable units, we've got seven units that are affordable, 20 that are going to be attainable. I'm wondering, and again, in the report, it kind of talks about the breakdown of cost uh, and the definitions of such uh, of, of what they would be. I'm wondering if you can give some insight into what the square footage of those units would be. Thank you for your question, uh, Councillor Russell, through you, Mr. Chair. We have not designed the building yet, um, so I can't comment on square footage. Uh, throughout the region, we've been pioneering different sizes to help address the affordability issue. Uh, we've been looking at different designs. Um, so until we, um, once now that, if, sorry, if we get zoning, the next step would be site plan. After site plan, we look at construction drawings. And at that point, we would lay out the building, the square footage, and the exact unit mix. Okay. Um, Follow-up, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, would it be fair to say that your intent would be to keep the cost per square foot lower for those attainable and affordable houses than they would be for the market price? Or are they just going to be much smaller units at basically the same square footage cost? Thank you for your, counsel, uh, your question. So let me address and unpack that a little bit for you. Um, so first, and I'm, I'd be happy to show you what we're building uh, and have constructed in the region to show you exactly what our affordable units today look like, how they have quartz countertops, 
the same as the other units, how they have in-suite laundry, the same as the other units. The quality, um, the finishings are the exact same from one unit to the other. To go to the square footage question, yes, managing costs and delivering an economic, uh, economically feasible, affordable unit to market is very challenging in today's climate. And one of the strategies that we do is reduce the square footage. Okay. Well, that's a fair question. And just one last follow-up. Um, <laughs> are any of them uh, multi-bedroom units? Just, again, I don't know, I know you haven't designed the building itself yet, but based on past experience uh, and your previous builds, are any of them multi so that instead of a single going in there, there could be a small family, uh, that type of thing? Thank you for your question. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councillor, the... I, you didn't ask, but I think I'm, and just clarify if I'm, I'm correct. Are you asking specifically for the affordable? The affordable units are typically studio or one bedroom. Um, that's for cost, square footage, to be able to deliver it economically. Uh, it's also to address the greatest need. Uh, the data that we have from Cansia, from the Niagara region, addresses it as the number one need uh, from a numbers perspective, from a percentage st standpoint as well. In regards to the attainable, uh, the attainable will be a balance between studio, one bedroom, and two bedroom units. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councillor Russell, um, Mr. Ta threw out an opportunity for us to um, have an opportunity to look at uh, some of his current builds. Uh, Councillor Murray, myself, Councillor Bernay, uh, Councillor Timmers was there. And he's he's changed the way that he does things based on his on his build. So his build in Welland, um, he took into effect that the the kitchen was bigger than it should have been, as opposed to the living area, and has made that adjustment. So it's constant refinement on as the market moves on 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 what the space um, could actually be used for. So I think that was a really salient point that we saw. In, and he committed to doing that going forward. Correct, Mr. Toth? Thank you, Chair. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McLuck. Thank you very much, Chair Patrick. Through you to the uh, delegation. So um, I, thank you for the presentation and the effort uh, you've made with staff uh, with respect to this. I'm looking at... Um, I mean, it's pretty significant. Like we are, you know, we, we do need affordable and attainable housing. It is pretty expensive to live in Lincoln currently. So, um, you know, and I appreciate the effort being made on the affordable piece, the attainable piece, and the uh, commitment to the 25 years. The question I have is how do you, as developers, how do you make these uh, estimations that you can financially make this work and that there's no no consideration that, you know, five or six years down the road, it's like, whoops, we, we can't do this. We can't, this business plan is not working. Um, something's come up. Um, and then another question that ties into that is like, what sort of data do you use currently to be able to make these projections and these cost estimates? How do you, how do you come up with that in these times with these interest rates? Several questions. I'll address each one of those. I try to get as many in there. Thank you. Uh, through you, uh, Chair. If I if I miss one, just um, let me know. So, first, how do we do a uh, a performa and a projection, and have confidence in our numbers, basically, in our economic model? So, part of the thing that helps is we're actively constructing these buildings in the Niagara region. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing that we do is we stress test all of our performers. We do best case, worst case, most likely case. We play with our square footage cost up and down. And anybody who's been con in construction or development any time, you know two things are gonna happen. It's gonna go longer than you originally estimated. And the second thing is, there's gonna be things that come up during construction costs that you didn't guess and you didn't plan your architect missed on a drawing your electrical engineer missed on a drawing and so you have to build a robust contingency budget with every one of your projects and so that is how we do it um, there's definitely 
you know, experience to it. There's definitely um, a, a very important element of contingency and stress testing your models. That's how we do it. Okay, th thank you very much. I, I, you know, I, I, um, nobody has a crystal ball, and um, I, I just want to make sure that we as a committee, followed by council as council, like that, that this actually happens the way it's projected to uh, happen, because lately projections for me have been quite challenging, and uh, I, I question projections, uh, you know, and, and the conservativeness of it, um, cost savings, potential uh, mitigation to offset um, unforeseen uh, financial issues that might arise. So um, hoping that, uh, you know, this is all accurate to the degree that you've um, brought forward. And if I may, uh, one more question is my last one. Yeah. Just um, with respect to the public, um, the public um, park space or the pop. Um, what exactly? What do you have planned for this space? To me, I think it works out to about 3,500 square feet. It's to, it doesn't seem like a lot for a community a community of this size. Um, what do you have planned for that space? Is there anything of interest that people will want to use that space, or is it just is it just space that you couldn't do anything with? So let's just plant grass and call it, a, you know, a park. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start, and then if you can answer the exact space. Uh, thank you for your question, Councillor. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, we could definitely get more yield from it, A, for that question. B, um, we do see the value in park space. Um, we previously had it on the other end of the development, and in response to public feedback, we moved it. Um, what is planned for this will be done at site plan. Uh, we'll be very happy to share what our landscape architect and our team designs uh, and share with you. But at the zoning uh, stage right now, we do not have a design for it. We've moved it. Uh, we've grown it. I mean, one of the interesting things is that the public will benefit from this uh, park. Well, we will pay to manage it. So instead of it coming out of the taxpayers' dollars, um, which most of the local parks do, and it's maintained uh, through uh, public dollars, this will be maintained through the condo dollars, uh, and the infrastructure of it will be funded by uh, our development team. So we don't know what will be there yet, um, but I assure you it won't just be a piece of grass. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rinchma. Uh, Councillor Mikola. Councillor Rinchma. Oh, thank you, Chair Patrick. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I was going to ask you a question about the green space, too. I think it's, um, I agree, there's a nice big park just down the road. It's great. It's a great park. It's within a very short walking distance. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what you're going to do with that green space because I think any, within any area, it's nice to have a place to just stop and sit down, right? You're taking for a dog for a walk, sit down, relax for a few minutes. Um, I have a question about the phasing of de the development. How are you planning to phase it? What's coming first? Thank you for your question. Uh, in regards to phasing, the first thing would be servicing, um, but we don't have a specific phasing plan yet. Um, once we have approval in place, if we get approval, um, and we move to site plan and further detailed design, it would be at that point. Um, that we get a specific phasing plan. But again, we'd be happy to share it with um, staff uh, and council as well. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Chair, I have another question. Uh, for the apartment, you said earlier on you don't have it designed yet. Um, have you given any thought to accessibility? I know that there's accessibility requirements you have to meet under the building code. Have you given any thought to, you, you've clearly given thought to affordability and so you're a community-minded person to that extent. Um, have you given any thought to going over and above in any way in terms of accessibility for the design of the building? Thank you for your question. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, we haven't put tons of specific thought to this building in regards to accessibility, um, but it's something always at the top of our mind. Uh, two weeks ago, I was speaking at the home show 
um, with one of our partners that does age in place uh, and accessibility features, uh, including um, kitchen cabinets, uh, grab bars, um, multiple accessories. So as we are learning and trying to stay at the leading edge of accessibility and of age in place, um, and we start designing the build, we will definitely look at what are the top products, what are the, the best practices. Um, myself and my wife actually have a uh, appointment with a, a company called Bloom in Mississauga, and you put on a suit, and it makes you feel like you have arthritis and vision and hearing loss, mm -hmm. and they show how the cabinets and everything can assist. So we're always trying to uh, put ourselves in the shoes of people with different needs, our clients, and see how we can best uh, service them. Yeah. There's some really cool stuff they're, they're putting out on the market now. Yeah, I've heard some of that. I'm on the Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee, and um, that was actually brought up at a, a meeting the other day, sort of virtual experiences. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think I was going to say something else, but I can't remember. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Renshma. Uh, Councillor Timmers. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Patrick Riva. As Vice Chair of the Housing Select Committee, I just wanted to highlight the fact that all of these numbers are based around our Lincoln's housing targets, the, the Niagara Region housing targets, that show us quite clearly that one-bedroom uh, units are very hard to find and in high demand. So these numbers are not just picked out of out of the air. They're they're there for a reason. And I'm quite pleased with the um, percentage of affordable and attainable. The agreement with the town with the 25 year is is very very um, positive. Um, I have a question around the parking. I know parking is always a, a big a big thing that everyone is concerned about. Um, could you just highlight um, just quickly the visitor parking? I, I may have missed that when you, you noted it. <clears throat> Through you, Mr. Chair, to uh, the councillor. Um, so we are, for if you're referring to the apartment, we're, we're providing 1.1 uh, 1 .1, uh, spaces per unit, um, which uh, works out to 69 spaces that are, are provided. Um, there are 75 spaces on site which available and um, we are meeting the town requirements for visitor parking on site as well at one space per 10 units. So there's a total of 69 spaces provided, uh, sorry, 75 spaces, <coughs> excuse me, provided um, for the 63 units that are being proposed. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> And as for the amenity space, I, I personally am not concerned about that. Um, I think it's it's um, a suitable piece. We have to remember that Ashby Park is about 490 feet from this development. That's half of my driveway. So, I mean, that's a pretty quick walk to the park, um, as well as Prokich Park. That is not very far. As someone who lives in a rural area, we don't have park space. Um, I, I think that is more than acceptable. Um, over 60% 60, 60 of all of Lincoln's parkland is in this area, in Ward 2. So I personally am not concerned at all about the uh, size of the amenity. I think it's, it's very suitable. So those are my comments. Uh, Chair, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Timmers. Um, Councillor Brené, you've asked some questions and you're in for a second time. And I had a couple of questions, so I was going to ask Vice Chair Murray if she would take the chair so I can ask, and then we'll go to you, if that's okay? Sure. Okay. Okay, well, then I'll just... I was going to say, yes, go ahead, Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Murray. Um, thank you, Drew and Dan. Um, question, and in, in, I want to go down the line of Councillor Brene on the groundwater. I mean, it's, it was 35 years ago when I took geology and university, but I mean, silty clay, clay silt, low permeability. So the water's going to sit there in the, uh, you know, above the shale and kind of run through that. So that's the, that's the reason for these sump pumps running in the neighborhood. So will the new development be equipped with sump pumps in the units? Thank you for your question. Um, 
we haven't planned sump pumps in each of the units, but that is will be something that we look at again at the next phases. Okay, because because my my kind of follow up to that is if you know I'm not a P engine and none of that, but just you know rudimentary uh, uh, findings or 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 studies. One would think that if they were equipped, it should lower the groundwater that the other homes are experiencing. And then plus with the, through public works, like the water's going to be put into curb and gutter. So it shouldn't flow over land. So I think if that's done, and then the, the hydrologist, if they can do like a supplementary report you know, to, to look at those findings, I think that might be positive. Now, I, and I wanted to I wanted to double back with um, our chief building official because I don't know if that's part of building construction. Um, I know when my house was built, it wasn't. We're up high and we don't need it, but but I, I think it's part and parcel of new home construction, especially you know in Vista Ridge and that those houses have equipped that. So I, I think that could be um, you know a, a solution to a lot of the the problems. May I respond? Yeah, yeah, please. Thank you. It's a good point. Uh, typically, when we build all of our homes, there's a sump pump. That sump pump is connected to the storm sewer, and that storms, uh, the storm pipe from the home goes to the street, to the larger storm sewer, and uh, is all managed outside of the site down to the lake eventually. OK, terrific. And second question through you, Vice Chair. Um, and, and Drew, we had talked about it. Um, you know, at the, at the first meeting, public asked about the access um, to the subdivision from the current driveway on Hickson to Calvary. And, and we're gonna see later that that's not possible based on some traffic geometrics and plans there for a couple semis. Um, but I had asked you, uh, and, and I'll ask in a public setting, um, just so it's on the record, um, about those two houses, the two semis facing onto Hickson the possibility of those being singles to conform with the existing neighborhood, right? Because it's it's all singles on that street. You know, the other side is going to have your semis. There's semis on on uh, Edward, but just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Thank you for your question, uh, Chair. Uh, yeah, so I guess I'm I'm going to ask one question of you, and then I I will respond. The the placement of a semi as opposed to a single detached, let's use that as an example, what is the concern of impact to the existing neighborhood? Well, I think without a typical, like a, a, a picture of it, right? So it's kind of, it's kind of um, sight unseen. So I think that would lower some of the trepidation Right and uh, you know Mayor Easton, I go back to our, our days of prudence, right? And I know it's probably not necessary in, in something like this, but it's almost like a 3D look at uh, you know spinning around. You, you guys have done a really good job with the with the um, apartment building, but looking for that same consideration, you know, giving the meshing of the of the fabric of the existing neighborhood. So just that's that's where I'm going with that, Drew. So I mean, if it's you know if there, there's a two story. There's a side split on the other side. If those mesh, right, and it's the fear of, of privacy that we heard with, with the other presentation tonight, so. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Uh, I can respond uh, correctly now. So integration into the existing uh, community is very important to us. Um, I think you've seen how we've worked back and forth. Um, so in regards to this specific uh, spot in these specific lots, I think um, what we are committed to doing is how do we uh, integrate that through design. So one thing that's very important is we have an architectural design code that governs the quality and the cohesion of the overall neighborhood, including these semis. Um, I'm very aware of those two houses. So the one house, sorry, Walking away from the <laughs> microphone. <laughs> uh, the, the one, if I'm staring at the driveway, join me looking to the left, there is a home and it has a, a barn-like top. And then there's a garage right beside it with a barn-like top. And when I look at that, I see uh, it's, it's like the massing 
and the building form of a semi. They're very close together. That's, that's how I see it. I don't know if everyone agrees. Mm -hmm. And then when I go to the right of that driveway, there's garage, single story, and then it's a semi back split. So it's kind of like you know, a, a story and a half, if you will. Very, very familiar, mm -hmm. it's white siding, um, et cetera. So what we would be looking at doing is, is keeping the semi, but how we approach the semi, uh, how we clad the semi, um, the height and the setbacks to make sure that we respect our neighbors to the left and to the right uh, to integrate uh, gently. Okay, terrific. And, and third question, if I may, Vice Chair Murray. Um, did I ask for, no, I think it's three and a half, two and a half. And now I've lost it in that in repartee. Uh, it'll come back to me, Drew. So th thank you very much. I'll go to Councillor Brunet. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, through you to, um, to Mr. Toth. So Drew, I know, you, uh, you know you've mentioned a couple times that um, you know, a lot of this stuff will be flushed out um, you know, during the site plan agreement and with public works staff, but um, a lot of the, you know, the concerns um, that we, Councillor Patrick and I have been hearing as word uh, is you know, construction will start, construction will, you know, will go, and you know, people will be impacted. So like we always say in these infill developments, we want to try to minimize the impact to these residents that are living there. So, and again, I realize we'll be fleshing this out with staff and we've already been talking to staff about this and, and kind of you know, getting some, some early talks, but from your position, so Edward Street, you're very familiar, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a dead end street, dead ends at the Calvary Gospel parking, parking lot. Um, you know, it's, it's been around for, for decades. Uh, it needs to be urbanized. And the anticipation is it will be urbanized. Uh, similarly, Bush is a dead end street at, at Street A, and there's guardrail there. And so from your position as a developer, is, is this something that you look at, that you're looking at these particular items where there's Edward Street, where it's, it's been a quiet, serene neighborhood for 40, 50 years, and Bush is a dead end where there's no construction activity you know, happening. As a developer, if this application moves forward, will you look at urbanizing Edward Street in the early phases of this, or have you not, have you not looked at this? I'm just, I'm, I'm raising this specifically because you know, residents have concerns when construction starts and construction goes on. And like you've mentioned, already mentioned, you know, we might say it's two years, it goes into three years, construction strikes, whatever. Uh, so in terms of mitigating these things, have, have you been speaking with staff and have you given any thoughts to those situations on Bush, which is a dead end, and Edward, which is a dead end? Thank you for your question. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councillor Brene, I'm gonna make sure I clarify. Um, as, as an infill developer, yes, I'm always looking for um, what existing space, how, how, how do the roads function, what's the feasibility. Um, your, your question, I need to clarify. What exactly do you mean by urbanization? I don't well, understand that. Well, er Edward Street is, it has no sidewalks, it has no curb and gutter, so we're gonna have to urbanize that. So, yes. um, you know, you're gonna go in there, you're gonna, you're gonna start doing your site servicing, you're gonna be putting pipe in the ground, you're gonna yes. start doing your, your street network. Have you looked, you know, in your discussions with better neighborhoods as you're planning this, have you looked at as to whether Edward Street would be something at the beginning of the project, would it be in the middle, or is it something you're gonna leave to the very end? I'm just looking at the impact of those residents. I, I understand your question now. Thank you for clarifying. Um, if we get approved, one of the next stages is the more detailed plan and site plan. After that, we sit with our engineers uh, and we look at a full construction plan. We look at a phasing plan and it's at that point we would be able to respond and give you the details and also to our neighbors as well. Um, we have opened up a dialogue with our neighbors. You guys have my personal cell phone, you have my email. I look at continuing to be your neighbor. So when construction starts, um, sorry, I was speaking to my neighbors there, but I got a low voice. Um, so when construction starts, 
we will send out notification and we will also go through the phasing plan with staff and we'll specifically communicate with council, specifically with the area councillors as well. Um, construction is frustrating, um, but our commitment is to work through it with the smallest impact that we can have and address any issues and concerns with forethought and also respond to any concerns during the construction process. That's our commitment, okay? Thank you, Chair. I have just one, one other question. So uh, again, through you to Mr. Toth. So, so you've talked about, you use the terminology economic model. You also used a couple times the word stress test. So after, and, and appreciating the fact that when we first met in our CAO's office, I didn't even know when that was, considerable amount of time ago, um, you were talking about a six-story apartment building. Um, you, you pivoted to five-story, and at the December 4th meeting, December 4th, 2023, you know, when this chamber was full, you, you heard from some residents about concerns uh, about a five-story building, and we are now at four-story, um, which is, we've come down on the number of units that we're providing. You know, Councillor Timmers talks about you know, the Housing Task Force, we're going to hear from Mr. Walker here in a few minutes about the Housing Committee and the need to supply housing and, and the needs of, you know, the, uh, the region. But what we have done, the, the ultimate thing is we have brought down the number of units from 105 to 63. That, that is correct, right? Through you, Chair, that is correct. So I'm just, I'm just wondering, Mr. Toth, after what you heard on December 4th, was there any thought as you went back to the drawing board with your consulting and your team to look at doing more cottages, more triplexes, more quads, or even back-to-back -back townhouses? Was that ever an option? Did you ever crunch that after hearing what you heard on December 4th? I'm, ju I'm just curious. Thank you for your question, Councillor Brene. Through you, Chair. We've looked at multiple models and house types. We are very set and very specific about the apartment building because the data, the information uh, shows us it is the greatest need. We are not just about dollars and cents. We are about a passion to bring more attainable and affordable housing in the Niagara region. And I believe that is proved out by the action that you're seeing with our developments, by what you guys saw. Um, it's interesting if you look at the number of units that are actually being created in the region and, and who's bringing them to market statistically, whether it's um, nonprofits, which are doing a great job, or it's Niagara Regional Housing, which is doing a great job, or it's private developments. But I, I think that the proof is in the data and the proof is in the number and the proof is in the action of what we're bringing to the community and to the region by what we are building and what we're actually delivering. And so um, we don't wanna do anything but the apartment building because we believe it is the right thing to do. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilor Brene. And I remembered my question, uh, Vice Chair Murray. So if, um, are we good? Go right ahead. Okay, thank you. So um, guys, um, question with respect to uh, existing homes. And, and I don't know, uh, Councilor Brene, I think asked it, but I don't know if he did. So I, I'm gonna ask it. So um, is there some type of Inspection done uh, prior to construction, homes uh, bordering uh, Hickson, Kennedy, Ashby, where you go in and uh, whether it's um, probably through an insurance company, you know, take pictures of, of um, foundations, uh, walls, things like that. Because we know that when infrastructure is put in and, and even uh, the homes themselves, there's a lot of vibrations, there's a lot of movement of of soil and type so that the existing homeowners will have um, some recourse that if there's cracks or damage caused during the construction phase that they'll have a recourse to be able to go back and say, hey, this wasn't here, so. Thank you for your question, Mr. Chair. Great comment. Um, 
It's actually uh, a best practice to do pre-construction surveys by a third party. That third party survey gives clarity to the neighbors. It gives clarity to us as a developer and constructor. And it also gives clarity to the community of what existed before, right? Because things come up, people have questions. We have a third party pre-construction survey that we can look at. It's best practices. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much. Okay. I see no further questions. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. So our next delegation this evening is Noel Walker of the Housing Select Committee. S sorry. Noel, please go ahead. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Councillors, uh, neighbors, and staff. Uh, my name is Noel Walker, and on behalf of the Housing Select Committee, I'm grateful for this oppor opportunity to speak regarding the draft plan for the subdiv subdivision application for 4129 Hickson Street submitted for the Council's consideration. While we are a little disappointed in the reduction of the number of affordable and attainable units in the proposed apartment building, we are still very supportive of the current concept. Although only seven, or 11% of the proposed rental units will have affordable rents, we note that this is an important first step towards meeting the town's own goal of building 140 units of affordable rental housing by 2051. We're also pleased by the town's conditions to ensure the minimum affordability period for um, minimum affordability period for the affordable and attainable housing is no less than 25 years. We're also pleased to see purpose-built rentals continue to be part of this proposal. As is shown in Appendix H of the report, only six uh, units of purpose-built rental housing for households of all ages have been constructed in the town of Lincoln since 1995. The majority of new rental units are found in condominium buildings as part of the secondary rental market. Purpose-built rental housing is a crucial component of a community's housing stock as they provide for stability and for tenant protections uh, greater than units rented out of condominium buildings. The information in this appendix also shows that rents have increased at a far faster rate than incomes. In conclusion, the Housing Select Committee believes that the proposed development successfully contributes to providing a wider range of housing options for renters and owner households in Lincoln. This range of housing is vital for allowing households of all ages and all types and all incomes to live, work, play and prosper in the town of Lincoln. Accordingly, the Housing Select Committee asks the Committee of the Whole to approve the proposed planning application. In addition to this, the Housing Select Committee encourages Council to keep the creation of affordable and attainable rental and ownership units at the forefront when reviewing future planning applications. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Noel. Um, any questions of this delegation from committee? Okay, I say none. Thank you very much. Thank you. So there being no further delegations, I have a motion moved by Councilor Murray that committee receive and file as information the following delegations regarding the official plan amendment, zoning bylaw amendment, and draft plan of subdivision application for 4129 Hickson, PD 14-24, Drew Toth, Elevate Living, and Dan Romanko, Better Neighborhoods Incorporated, and Noel Walker, Housing Select Committee. I will now ask your deputy clerk to open the vote. Thank you, Chair. That vote's now open. Mayor Easton, may I have your vote, please? Support, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bernay in support, did I? Yes. Thank you. And Councillor Regima? Oh, I just got yours. Thank you. I'll go ahead and close that vote, and that motion carries. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, Devan. So we will now consider the associated report, PD 14-24, regarding the official plan amendment, zoning bylaw amendment, and draft plan of subdivision application for 4029 Hickson. The Director of Planning and Development will provide commentary. Matt, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, maybe I'll start off with a little bit of policy context. 
Um, some of you have probably already heard this from me more than once, but I feel it important just to kind of set the stage on that front, moving into my additional comments. So when reviewing applicable policy uh, in considering development applications, higher levels of government set frameworks that municipalities are required to abide by. In the past few years, there has been a stronger push than ever for more housing, and that's in policy that's implemented, not you know, statements that are made in response to, to a political back and forth, but we're talking about policies in place. Um, specifically housing that maximizes efficient utilization of available urban lands, including various housing options at a range of affordability. Policy direction continues to evolve at a rapid rate. In fact, in fact, much quicker than municipalities are able to update their corresponding policy documents at the local level. We often get asked, what's the point of even having a zoning bylaw if there remains an opportunity to amend it? Uh, the constant state of change of overarching provincial policy is a significant factor here, coupled with the town's currently limited supply of existing urban lands that can accommodate growth, let alone larger vacant parcels that provide opportunities to accommodate the growth that we know is coming. The zoning bylaw establishes a baseline and through its provisions provides guidance pertaining to arrangements of land uses. Zoning is also applicable to the town as a whole and similar to all other municipalities in the province that are experiencing the same thing, applications to amend zoning bylaws are often submitted to address site-specific circumstances and to recognize the most up-to-date policy. In the case of this application, a portion of the requested zoning amendments were actually to introduce lower density land uses in the other, otherwise medium density zoning on the lands uh, around most of the perimeter, including some larger lot sizes or rear yard setbacks to provide appropriate transition with existing dwellings. In these areas, the build form is similar to the existing with some minor, with some minor relief in things like lot coverage and lot frontage, for example. The proposed unit's interior to the site include provisions to establish more compact lot fabrics while still maintaining provisions for items such as landscaped open space. The zoning amendment to permit the apartment building establishes the multi-unit form given the opportunities to maximize separation from existing dwellings and the efforts in achieving appropriate transition within the context of providing uh, more options of housing including affordable opportunities. The application process provides an opportunity for the town, for us staff, to hear input from residents and council, which we work to balance against the latest policy directions. In this and virtually every other application process, staff have been able to work with applicants to refine their proposals. Through this process, there have been substantial changes to the subject proposal, some of which have already been mentioned, but I'll summarize them again quickly. Um, they include, first of all, a significant reduction in the number of apartment units from initially 105 down to 63 dwelling units, which represents approximately a 40% reduction from what was initially proposed by the applicant. We mentioned a reduction in building height, which is what we heard a lot at the public meeting went from six stories initially to five, now to four. But importantly, the actual measured height went from a maximum of 26 meters down to only 15 meters, which is now only two and a half meters or eight feet higher than what's permitted in the area as of right. We talked about an improved parking ratio, which comes part and parcel with a reduction in the unit count for the apartment building. So I won't go into detail of that again, but the most important thing was we heard loud and clear that visitor parking needed to be incorporated uh, for the apartment building, which it now is. Um, again, what was talked about, the initial proposal didn't include any open space at all. Uh, there was some space added in the second submission. Further refinements now, again, relocation and a minor increase in size, um, and now it's more central to the site. Culminating is an overall reduction in density for the development. Initially, it was around 68 units per hectare, which is slightly above the medium density designation range in our official plan. Um, it's now down to 54 dwelling units per hectare, which is within that range. Um, that's inclusive of the apartment and all the dwellings uh, proposed in the proposed development. In addition to these changes, staff also fur further evaluated other significant components of the proposal, some based on diligence of the process, some based on comments received. Um, for example, with respect to infrastructure capacity, um, we reviewed materials submitted by the applicant, uh, which also passed through the region, and it was confirmed that the proposed development won't require any infrastructure upgrades along Hickson Street to accommodate the proposed development. Um, also, since the applicants are proposing to connect to Edward Street, as was mentioned, um, they will need to upgrade it to the town's typical urban standard, which would include things like curbs and sidewalks. Now, uh, that was discussed a little bit with respect to timing, which again will be confirmed at a later date, but ostensibly uh, staff would be looking for it probably earlier on just as the other road work is occurring because that's kind of the sensible progression. 
Um, the proposed design allows for increased on-street parking opportunities too, and that's due to the implementation of the rear lanes uh, for this development instead of front yard driveways. Whereas the minimum uh, ratio implemented in other recent subdivisions for on-street parking is 0.4 spaces per dwelling. The proposed development is up around 0.58 spaces per dwelling, so a significant improvement uh, based on those design considerations. The proposed dwellings along the exterior of the development largely mirror, mirror the existing dwellings. I heard some comments uh, so far tonight about the incorporation of semis as well as singles. A lot of times, semi-detached dwellings can be, their, their build form is very similar to single detached dwellings. So there's an opportunity there to make sure that we maximize harmony between those and the existing singles um, on the site. Um, when I look at the apartment building, we looked at, at transition. It was already mentioned, I won't go through over the measurements again, but there is uh, a, a good distance further than what we would typically see for infill opportunities away from existing uh, properties, which was an important consideration and one that we were key was, or we were clear that was key from the get-go, just to ensure compatibility, considering that transitional housing in between. Um, the applicants also included, and you probably saw on some of the materials that are included in the appendices to the report, as well as online, but there was an angular plane analysis done, which is a 45 degree angular plane. It's a, it's a planning tool really to, to look at how transition, how built form and height work with existing dwelling units. And what was shown through that analysis is the visual impacts of the apartment building are, are, are minimized by A, now the reduction in height, and B, the transitional dwellings. Um, the proposed development provides a wide range of housing types, sizes and at varying price points, including a purpose-built component, um, which is all consistent with current planning policies of the province, region, and town. We do have a condition written into the report for a housing agreement between the town and developer that will require that the proposed apartment buildings maintain the ratios of, of well, first of all, maintain the purpose-built rental status, but also the ratios of affordable and attainable units for a period of 25 years. That will be registered on title. Um, and we also even took a look at the location of the pro proposed apartment building. Just from, we looked at it through CMHC's lens of looking at amenities and, and, and certain services that future residents would, requ would require. And there was 10 criteria in there, and the proposed location of the apartment building met nine of those criteria. I won't list them, but it is included in the report. One of the big things was looking at the traffic. I know it was mentioned, you know, the, the, the TIS, or the traffic impact study, looked at um, some data that was perhaps a little bit dated. However, there was a couple things done to mitigate that, and this is pretty standard when it comes to traffic impact assessments. First of all, it was, it was mentioned that, you know, the COVID pandemic had an impact. That's true. So there was an adjustment factor applied to that to account for what there should be increase in volumes. And on top of that, um, there was also a, a 2% compound, compounded annual growth rate applied to the numbers going out to 2030, which is standard industry practice um, and also in excess of what the town's overall growth rate has been in the past couple of years. So all in all, there, it is true that some of the counts and turning movements available were a little bit older, but they were updated based on some of those endeavors. Um, overall, the, the assessment concluded that the proposed development will not reduce the functionality of intersections at key locations surrounding the proposed development. And in addition, an analysis of traffic volumes to and from the site concludes that the volumes dispersed through three different access points as proposed into the development will not result in high traffic numbers. This analysis was undertaken initially too when the apartment unit count was still at 105. So there's been a significant reduction in the amount of units, 40% of the apartment, which translates to a little over 20% for the overall development, a reduction in unit count. So the amount of vehicle, vehicular trips will be lower. Finally, one other thing to touch on before uh, fielding any questions from council is on the groundwater side of things. It is true, um, Councillor Brene mentioned it and I agree, it's not, not localized to one specific property, the concerns that have been noted, we agree. Um, as part of this, usually at the zoning stage you go through, it's more of a preliminary design or feasibility analysis. And then you get into your detailed design as was mentioned later on. But we did obtain a groundwater opinion letter which did talk about the kind of reduced ability for the site from an infiltration perspective and also that the development would reduce permeability, necessitating assurance that we're diligent on the surface water and drainage management component, but also um, indicating that 
impacts from, from groundwater or on the groundwater side of things would be limited by the development. That said, we do understand it's a significant concern. We're going to be committing uh, towards requiring additional groundwater investigations that we will work to scope um, by the applicant, and there's opportunities too to, to look at that and evaluate it further um, should this proceed to detailed design. So we're not done just with the simple groundwater opinion letter. We will be looking at um, further opportunity to, uh, to flush that out and make sure we're properly addressing um, any potential impacts. So those are my comments, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Matt. Do um, members of committee have any questions? Councilor Bernay. Uh, thank you, Chair Patrick. But through you to Mr. Bruder. Um, Council received a, a letter from um, the Calvary Gospel Church from the from the Board of Directors with concerns um, that there would not be suffi suffi sufficient parking. Uh, and in the letter, it referred to a concern um, that at times there might be overflow parking from the uh, Cal from the uh, four-story apartment uh, coming over onto the Calvary Gospel Church. I'm wondering if you could comment on uh, the first part of, you know, not being sufficient parking. I'd like your, your position on that, your, your comment on that, and, uh, and just, you know, the impact to the, uh, to the development. Through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, good question, Councillor. And we did have an opportunity, the CAO and myself, to engage uh, the chair for the church uh, to discuss this as well. Some of the some of the concern was mitigated just by virtue of clarifying that um, you know we did see there being a concern initially with the proposed parking ratio that was previously brought forward. So, but with the reduction in the units and the improved parking ratio and the visitor parking and the increased on-street parking that's gonna be available um, throughout the development, um, there seemed to be some, some, a higher level of comfort with those details provided. In addition, I think with the overflow, there was some concern too uh, with respect to you know, the provision of a fence um, you know, in between the two sites, in between the apartment and, and the church. That's something too that we're gonna be looking at and we'll be able to accomplish uh, during the next stage of the project. But I also wanted to note, just generally speaking with the church itself, I know that was a concern brought forward, but they're also going through an addition of their own and through that they're adding a significant amount of parking on their own site, up to now 148 parking spaces, which is well in excess of what the zoning uh, requirements would be for that property. So hopefully that clarifies for you, Councillor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, through you, uh, Chair, um, again to Mr. Bruder, um, I, I might have missed it in the report. Uh, you know, it's a pretty lengthy report, and I appreciate all the work that Josh Workington has put in on this and his responsiveness to uh, many of the residents that have reached out directly to him. Um, but we don't have far to go um, just down to the Cherry Heights uh, subdivision a few years ago uh, when we had uh, major issues with uh, some Indigenous artifacts and findings. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could comment on... Um, whether a stage one archeological um, uh, survey has, has occurred or, or uh, just what the position on that is and uh, the process of that, if I could. Yeah, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So there was an additional archeological investigation undertaken, I believe a stage one, which is more kind of a, a cursory or desk, desktop review. Um, I, there wasn't any significant resources identified through that, but um, I think we're still awaiting from some response from uh, the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport. I don't know what they're referred to now, the exact acronym. But if there's stage two requirements, which is some test pitting, um, that could be done during the subsequent study as well. But up to date, there's been no significant concerns or resources identified. Uh, thank you for that. And through you, Chair, if I could just ask an, another question of Mr. Bruder. So Matt, um, we, we've heard over the last number of years with all the uh, construction and the development that has occurred up in the top end of Ward 2, and specifically Vista Ridge and, and Cherry Heights. Um, during the construction period, we've heard of, you know, lots of concerns, lots of issues with regards to noise, construction starting early in the morning that maybe are, isn't meeting our bylaw as construction, um, you know, moves along heavy construction traffic, forklifts traveling down the middle of the road with the safety of the residents that live in that area, as well as keeping the roads clean, 
uh, you know, from dirt and mud and water. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves here, but, you know, for the residents that have been expressing this concern for quite some time, um, and I know you have been diligent and your, your staff on the engineering side and bylaw have been uh, much more attentive, I would say, from my individual experience over the last little while, but um, if this application were to move forward, you know, what, what can you say from, from the Director of Planning on, on how we anticipate to deal with these issues that will be real, uh, they won't be fictitious, they will be occurring, but how will we be dealing with them and how will the enforcement be handled? To you, Mr. Chair, good question, and there's a few different things to, to disseminate with that. Um, first of all, when it comes to noise, I agree with you. That is something we've been experiencing lately. As a matter of fact, on a different development site, I won't say which, um, we're actually looking at uh, moving forward with a charge because there's been consistent issues with respect to construction start in the morning. So it is something that we're paying closer attention to in recognition that, yeah, there's, there's residents there that are being impacted by it. So we're going through that process there and we're fully prepared and, and we will continue monitoring and listening to the input we receive from the community and we'll address the same type of issues the same way um, should this application go forward. From a, a construction vehicle movement point of view, again, I think, you know, when I look at, it was mentioned kind of the local roads, um, Edward and Bush going out those ways, that's not where we would envision a lot of the heavy construction traffic going. So staff has, have already been engaging. Should we get to that point, what we do, is it, you know, barricading those roads? Is it, you know, working to maybe keep at the north or at the south and the guide rail in place? These are things that we're considering to try to keep or, or minimize construction vehicles on the local roads. Um, from a fouling roads perspective, it is something, you're right, we have been paying closer attention to. In, in fact, I know there was a few instances and I think we got a little bit better feedback uh, with some of the site alterations happening on the, on the west side of Mountain, just making sure that we get those, uh, any, any, you know, things are gonna happen where there is gonna be some, some construction, some dirt or, or other construction related materials on the road. I think it's more ensuring a timely response to make sure that it gets addressed very quickly instead of sitting there for, for days. So a lot more timely response. We have our development engineering staff um, out on site much more often now, especially because there's two of them for a long time, or for a while we only had one. So uh, we're able to, to kind of share that workload and make sure that we're a little more diligent moving forward. Thanks very much, I appreciate those responses. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councilor Brene. Councilor, or Vice Chair Murray. Thank you very much, Chair. Through you to um, Director Bruder. Um, Matt, I recognize that we've got a long way to go uh, until this is finalized and approved and, and actually begins uh, moving forward. But I know that there's people in our community who are excited about the opportunity for an availability of new uh, purpose-built rentals and affordable and attainable as defined by the province and by the region. Uh, your report on page 11 and 13 has charts about what that looks like. Um, but this is the first time that something like this has come forward while I've been sitting in this chair. So I wondered if you could provide a little bit of um, just logistically speaking, how does that work? So if somebody in our community is looking at this and saying, hey, this is going to be perfect, how can they, how, how do they move forward with that? It, do we work in, in tandem with um, public organizations? Uh, what does that look like? Through Mr. Chair, I'm going to uh, defer to Mr. Workington for a response on that. Uh, thank you, uh, <coughs> Director Bruder. Uh, through you, Chair. So typically the town is not involved in helping uh, residents find housing. Uh, typically that it's other done through the region, which is the uh, province's or the area's service manager. Um, or they'll go through uh, a community agency like Community Care in West Niagara. Or in this case, they might go directly to um, the applicant's um, housing manager or um, if, if they're managing it themselves, just straight to the, uh, the property itself. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Chair Murray. Uh, Council Rinchema. Thank you, Chair Pachariva. Um, through you to staff, there was um, some discussion about uh, traffic, and I'm hearing that the impact study um, is concluding that there's not going to be a huge impact in terms of congestion and et cetera. Uh, but there is going to be, and pardon me if this was discussed earlier and I didn't pick up on it, but there is going to be sort of a straightaway 
um, created between what uh, Councillor Brené was talking about, the connection of Bush Crescent and Edwards Street. Do we have any plans uh, for any kind of traffic calming or potential stop signs in that straightaway, the north-south? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I can let Director Graham jump in a little bit too, but generally speaking, the answer is yes. Uh, when we look at what's being contemplated for, let's say, Edward Street, for example, there's things like raised pedestrian crossings that are being contemplated. There's also additional traffic calming just by virtue of some narrower right-of-ways with some on-street parking, which are typical for traffic calming, traffic calming methods. But uh, I'll defer to Director Graham if he's got anything to add. Uh, th thank you, uh, Director Bruder, and uh, through you, Chair, to the Councillor. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so the, the, sub the actual developer is incorporating traffic calming within their development. We're also looking at expanding traffic calming um, on Edward Street. Uh, we also have uh, some preliminary plans to do additional traffic calming along Hickson Street, looking at uh, you know a number of different strategies to slow traffic. Um, <clears throat> that'll be something that we will be sharing with the community as we get closer to that. Um, Ashby Drive uh, being the other uh, exit to the subdivision uh, or the proposed development, we do have traffic calming on that road already. So our, I think we really feel that, you know, we're looking at traffic calming on all the surrounding roads and connections. I thought you might be. <laughs> um, one more question through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, any proposed stop signs for that stretch of Edwards Street and Bush Crescent? Uh, through uh, chair to, to the councillor, yes, there's going to be some uh, new always stops uh, along Edward Street as part of the development. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, thank you, Councillor Renshma. Councillor McLuck. Thank you very much, Chair Patrick. Through you to Matt and uh, Josh. I'm just curious. It's intrigued me about this sump pump and um, the water issue. Uh, I don't typically from other developments or infill developments that we've had heard complaints or concerns about um, sump pumps and this sort of thing and the delegation uh, Drew and um, his partner they didn't really specify whether or not there was going to be sump pumps in this area so I'm trying to understand the report that was made with res respect to surface water if this report was made and it, it was a professional report, why wouldn't we know whether or not some pumps were required or are required at this time? Why do houses in that area already have sump pumps? Through you, Mr. Chair. So first thing to clarify is that sump pumps will be required okay. in, in the houses in this development. Uh, but second, I think if you're referring, are you referring to the groundwater kind of opinion letter that we got, Councillor? Yeah. Yeah, with respect to that, that was more trying to assess of the existing conditions the existing permeability of the site and the overall groundwater table and some of the subsoil conditions and whatnot and how you know there could be potential impacts or not to groundwater it wasn't really jumping ahead to whether or not some pumps would be needed but i can tell you that they will be included in the development okay thank you for clarifying that and i'm when i'm looking at this um this site plan you know there it used to be a lot of grass it used to be a lot it used to be an open field and now it's it's pretty much roofs roofs and you know pavement uh, or asphalt not 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 a lot of green space to absorb water so surface water I think is a concern especially when you hear other municipalities threatening to impose a rain tax of some sort because of this um, uh, type of um, redevelopment of property so that that I want to make sure that we don't negatively get impacted from a financial perspective, having to deal with the storm sewer uh, capacity. Um, so, with respect to all this surface water and, and you know groundwater and all of that, neighbors are uh, they're, they're saying right now that their sump pumps are running this much. Um, as development rolls along. Who are we listening to as far as who's, who's determining whether or not some pumps are running more frequently as development starts um, moving forward? Do we just say, no, sorry, it's, it's, it's the, the, the consultant says it's not the, pro it's not the problem, you know, like how, how, who, who, is, who is that judgment that determines whether a resident is accurate in their assessment that the sump pump is running 
more or less than it was before. Through you, Mr. Chair. So I'm just going to back up just a second and I'll talk a little bit about how surface water is, is going to be managed on site because really I think that's, that's an important factor here. I think first of all what, what everybody needs to understand is um, you know, whether or not there's a lot of asphalt and driveways and, what, and roof lines, we still need to manage post-construction runoff to pre-development levels, meaning it has to be contained on site and then released controlled release, which is, which is going to be done in this case through oversized pipes that are underground, a couple storage tanks with orifice plates that really minimize the amount of water that leaves the site all at one time. And they're going to be, there's going to be some of this site that's going to be directed out to Ashby Pond. There's going to be some that's directed out to Hickson that goes down to Cherry Heights Pond. And all of the preliminary calculations to determine feasibility of under, you know, that it's been demonstrated that it works from a capacity standpoint. Now on to groundwater. Your, your question is good because again, you're right, sometimes it is a little bit difficult, you know, if somebody's sump pump is running a lot more, you know, is that, is that automatically mean it's because of development nearby in the area? I think the question is not necessarily, there's a lot of factors. So I think what we do, generally speaking, is, again, in this case, everybody heard me commit to it earlier that we're going to be asking for some additional detailed groundwater investigations that happen um, through the detailed design process as well as that extra layer of diligence to make sure that we're evaluating uh, the potential for groundwater to affect um, properties that are adjacent to the development and the larger catchment area. So that's the first lens. On the second, generally speaking, I think, you know, with a sump running more often, again, difficult to, to assess, but, you know, I, I heard earlier confirmation with respect to from kind of a accountability perspective, what happens if there's say, you know, damage as a result of groundwater uh, to an adjacent property? Well, you know, there isn't a professional engineer that does sign those drawings and we make sure that we require that and we're gonna be requiring these additional investigations. So again, I think by demonstrating that extra layer of diligence, we're able to at least prove that, you know, and unless there's something identified that we've gone through those measures. So. Again, with, with sumps running more often, um, the, the idea is that we, we assess conditions and, and uh, work towards them not. Okay, thank you. I, I think that's good to hear that there's going to be engineers signing off on this um, to take care of it. And, and then one final question. Um, so we're, we're, you know, there's, there's always a concern of this height, this four-story height, this, um, it, it, it how do we deal with this as council, as planners, when, you know, we're, when recently we hear government officials like say that uh, residents will lose their minds if we build or approve four-story uh, fourplexes or four-story buildings next to single detached houses? How do we navigate through these sorts of discussions at upper levels? Or how does planning departments, how, how, how do we... How does, how does professional planning staff and how does council deal with these sorts of uh, comments? Through you, Mr. Chair, there's a, there's a couple of things in there. First of all, you know, when we look at how planning, for example, reviews these things, we heard loud and clear from residents, we even heard from members of council, six stories, five stories, both too much. So again, we kind of work to try to balance what's in policy, not off the cuff comments made by a premier that are really in response to what uh, uh, liberal proposal was to allow four plexes and four stories as of right, we look at what's actually implemented in policy. So that is kind of the, the lens in which we review certain comments like that. I agree, in some cases it is difficult when you look at intensification and transition, but in this case, uh, when I look at, first of all, what's been done from a compromising perspective, um, lowering the, the building height significantly, but also looking at really the transition op opportunity that is possible at this site. You're not talking about a building right next to a, a single detached dwelling that's towering over it. In this case, as you've heard, we're well over 50 meters or 200 feet from the closest property line. All the other property lines significantly more. That coupled with uh, the negotiations that have brought down the building height. And even, I can tell you, in conversations with the applicant, we looked at other opportunities, other built forms um, under the lens of us still maintaining a level of affordability and attainability. And going through that process, again, yes, we resulted in a lower building, but again, from a viability perspective, it was determined that this particular built form could still yield some affordability and attainability uh, units. So all those pr perspectives combined, that's how we 
look at these types of things. Hopefully that clarifies for you. No, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Mikula. Councillor Reimer. Thank you, Chair Patrick Riva. Um, thank you to staff for this report. Uh, Josh, uh, specifically, has been mentioned already, the uh, page 10 to 13, the uh, the attainable and affordable housing charts and the way you laid it out and, and uh, um, the rest of your staff. Just thank you very much for that. It was it was easier to, to uh, comprehend that whole uh, issue. So thank you very much for that. Um, through you, Chair, to uh, a couple of questions of clarification through you to uh, to Josh. Um, reading the motion in the uh, in our in our H provisions, I know we've been over some of these in some different developments before, but the requirement C uh, in the H holding provision reads: sufficient wastewater services are or will be available to accommodate the proposed development to the satisfaction of the region of Niagara and the town of Lincoln. And I know later on in in your report we we. Uh, it's written, uh, you know, under the uh, explanation summary of our own Lincoln uh, official plan policy. Uh, the review there, there's uh, no infrastructure upgrades needed. You know, the uh, the functional service report that was submitted by the applicant, and then some third party um, confirmation that waste, storm, and water are sufficient. So why do we not have to have, or why is just wastewater mentioned in the H provision? Through you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. And, and that's a, a really good question. So one of the main concerns, uh, you know, as, as we go through these, these processes is ensuring there's sufficient water and sanitary sewer capacity. So as part of the functional servicing report, it was determined that there's enough water pressure and capacity uh, for domestic and fire flows for the entire development. In terms of wastewater, we have to look at the entire system. So uh, we looked at uh, the system as a whole. And um, the development itself didn't require any upgrades, particularly along Hickson Street, because that was one area that was uh, flagged very early on as a potential item uh, where capacity could be concerned. Thanks to public works, as well as some of the other uh, things that have been going on, uh, we've been able to determine um, that there is capacity in the Hickson Street sewer. So it doesn't need to be upgraded at this time. Part of that's through uh, the reduction of I and I uh, flows mm -hmm. into the sewer. Where it becomes, um, I don't want to say challenge, but uh, a bit of a, a time, matter of timing is the capacity at the end of the line. As we, you may have learned or, or know, uh, the Ontario Street uh, pumping station needs to be upgraded. And uh, the town has some capacity left over, so we want to make sure that there's, that capacity is still there when the time comes for the holding provision to be lifted and building permits to be issued. So uh, I hope I answered your question. Yes, you did. That's. Uh that's kind of remarkable that far down the line that there be that we so I guess it's our line all the way down so that enables us to put that H provision on there as a town. Uh, it, it is, but um, we the town does not own the entire uh, line. Um, our sewer extends up to Green Lane, and then it's the region from that point north to the pumping station. But we work in very close collaboration with the region. Uh, and with my uh, colleagues here in, in Public Works to uh, ensure that there's enough capacity for both uh, existing residents and, and new developments. Mr. Bruder, you've got some additional comments? Yeah, just a couple. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just with respect to that too, um, I did want to note, you know, we, we have been, as Josh notes, working very closely with the region. They are going through some of their design work now for that trunk and that pumping station at the end of the line. Um, this is a holding provision we've also applied uh, to some other recent development applications. And really the reason is um, just to make sure that everything aligns. It just gives us that extra lens, that extra ability to make sure that the timing works out. And it's just a matter of diligence we're, we're, we're doing. In addition, Public Works is doing some inflow and infiltration reduction that is um, impacting or improving rather capacity, current capacity available in that line. But again, just to make sure everything works as it should, this is an extra measure that we've been implementing lately. Thank you. One more, if I may, uh, Council Patriva. Um, and also along those lines, through through you, Chair, to Josh, um, as it's as it was proposed and, and it's been and spoken of here already, the Edward Street uh, would uh, under this proposal receives urbanization, so sidewalks, curbs, etc. Um, and it is not mentioned in the H provision. Is that captured somewhere else under site plan agreement, or just looking for some clarification on that? Through you, Chair, that's another good question. Um, it will be dealt with in the um, plan of subdivision approval. It's actually one of the conditions within it. So okay. uh, in order to get plan of subdivision approval, sure. they'll need to uh, 
have a design that uh, uh, meets the town standards and also works with conjunction with the uh, residents on Edward okay. Street. So, okay. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Reimer. Councillor Russell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to uh, Mr. Bruder. Um, I think uh, Councillor Mikulik's uh, questions about drainage uh, were, were quite good, and I thought your responses as well were, uh, were quite uh, on point. Um, but I think it, a couple more whacks at it, if you don't mind. Um, in particular, again, you mentioned that there are going to be further steps that will be taken during site plan approval that may uh, either bring to light some potential drainage issues, if there are any, um, or maybe create some uh, ideas of mitigating them uh, if they are found. But is there any direct recourse? I, again, I don't know if, I know it was mentioned by some of the residents that uh, they're having issues already. Um, what happens if three years after this is built out, um, there are uh, issues that come up? What's the recourse for the existing residents around uh, to come back and get uh, either some remediation or try to uh, fix uh, what may have been caused by uh, the development if it is deemed that it was related? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Some of that depends a little bit on how things are faced because, you know, if the subdivision, for example, hasn't been assumed yet, there might be opportunities that staff can work with the, the applicant, the, the developer, because they're still going through the process to look at mitigation options should something happen. I mean, again, our efforts and our diligence that I'm talking about tonight are, you know, in working towards it not happening, but in the effect, in the event that it does, again, if, if it manifests itself as the subdivisions built out but not yet assumed, there is some ability for us to work directly with the design staff to make sure we address those issues. And again, I think we're talking more about you know damage to property and things that are happening, right? Yeah. And then you know if this were to happen, you know let's just play it out where you know the the subdivision has been long assumed and you know there's time that goes by, and then. There, there's a groundwater issue. Again, it gets a little more tricky in terms of, you know, it, it, since all that time has gone by and the development has happened, is it a result of that? It very well might be, but that's when the culpability, that's when um, the engineering certification comes in handy because there's still culpability of that professional that signed off on the designs, submitted the, the investigation reports and those things. So there's culpability there. Staff play more of an assisting, assisting role there in provision of information and trying to, you know, bring the two sides together. But again, from that perspective, once the subdivision's fully built out and time goes by, it's a little bit harder for the town to get involved in the recourse. No, I appreciate that, and just a comment. Um, I know that when, uh, again, a number of the residents came up and gave their thoughts, we didn't get really into the seasonality of whether or not, uh, again, it's after a big uh, snowfall and we get a quick thaw. Like, we didn't get into that level of detail. Um, and again, just the way kind of the seasons have gone uh, over the last few years, we're seeing less and less snowfall. So we may see a spell where for five or six years uh, there is no significant um, accumulation of snow and ice, and then once it thaws, uh, again, it creates issues. Um, so we may not see an issue until after it's assumed. So as long as there is some recourse that residents can come back and we can then either go back to the developer, go back to um, if it's uh, the engineer and, and, and look at what they provided. Um, again, I think that'll give uh, the residents a little bit more peace than just knowing that, okay, we're going to do some reports up and uh, hopefully that they're going to uh, address any issues that may come up, uh, but I think having an actual direct action plan that if something does come up, that there is some accountability on our side. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Russell. Councillor Brené, you've, you've been in, so before I go to you, I'm going to ask Vice Chair Murray to take over so I could ask a couple of, oh, okay, we've got the Mayor. So before I go, we'll let the Mayor come in. So Your Worship, go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Um, generally speaking, I want to comment, um, Mr. Chairman, on the quality of um, the justifications and uh, explanations that the staff have provided. And um, I had also requested um, a list of all the items that were the most important to the public. And um, because I wanted to make certain this evening that there was a level of objectivity uh, in the responses that were given. And I, I thank um, Matt very much for that additional work. It was very helpful to me. A couple of things. Um, I just want to add an extension to the discussion that um, has come up a couple of times about um, the water flow and um, the issues that may or may not exist and the reasons why. 
And I'd like to suggest, Mr. Chairman, that there be an, inspect an inspection of all properties um, to determine what the current conditions are, as uh, it is not uncommon for us to find that um, as trees develop and roots um, uh, get into the systems uh, where um, there's um, landscaping that takes place on properties from property to property, and these um, can all add up to barriers um, so that water doesn't flow as well as it um, as it could be. And I'd also like to point out that uh, the Kitchener-Waterloo area is decades ahead of, um, of many communities, including ourselves, where they have um, been um, uh, influencing the uh, low-impact development, particularly around driveways and um, the uh, semi-permeable um, features. Uh, otherwise, uh, if you're uh, reluctant to move into this uh, area of uh, enlightenment, you will pay uh, greater taxes uh, because uh, water begins to move quickly. So those are um, some comments in response to uh, some of the earlier comments and questions. Um, however, I want to um, I want to ask um, Mr. Mr. Bruder a question, and I have not asked him this question, but it has come up tonight as I heard the response um, and the uh, the overview provided by the the select committee. And I think it's great that the select committee are so generous with us, but I think we should um, we should not uh, take great pride in the loss of 42 apartment dwelling units when that is the area of greatest need. 42 lost, including um, the loss um, in one of the earlier developments that uh, that we um, approved, and. Um, and in Josh's comments in the report, particularly on page 13, down at the bottom where we look at proposed rents and the conformance with provincial and Niagara regional definitions for affordable and attainable, it's great that we meet the criteria. But if we cannot bring ourselves to actually conform with the volume that we need, then what really, you know, what pride can we take in meeting the needs of our community. Uh, I don't think I've seen, Mr. Chairman, a report as comprehensive as this in terms of its response to the public. It really is terrific. Um, it was a great effort by the community to get their issues on the table. The staff did an outstanding job of responding. However, we are still on this unit alone 42 short. And you and I have had a conversation and we can talk about the incrementalism of all of this. But I, I, again, this is the second time that I've done this and I'll continue to do it. We are not making progress. We are making some incremental changes. And I think if we do not have the force of the select committee behind us, if they're going to continue to be soft on this issue and not bring us to task, we're not going to move any any further. So I hope that Mr. Brood has been thinking about this and not just the planning elements of it. And so I would like him to provide a little response. I've talked as long as I can to help him uh, gather his thoughts together, but I do believe that this is core to our ability to move forward. All of the other technical issues, we have clearly demonstrated that we have the, the ability to respond to them. However, we have not proven and we have not demonstrated that we can respond to the numbers and we have failed to do it again. So, Mr. Bruder. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think there's a couple ways that you can look at it. You know, I, I, you're right, Your Worship, we have seen a, a unit count which in turn has reduced the yield of, of potentially affordable and or, or attainable units, but at the same time, uh, in in my opinion, you know, it, it's, it is a balancing act. We do have existing residents in this particular area, and we do have an obligation to try to come up with a, a transition and, and a, you know, a compatibility range that, yes, it may not check off all the boxes on either sides, but that's what we try to do is, is strike the best compromise 
uh, we can. And you hear often that, you know, while there's not a huge amount of units being provided here, it still is helpful. It still provides a housing stock that we don't have a lot of. There still are affordable and, attain and attainable units that are being proposed in this building. So uh, I, I do see your point on one end, Your Worship, but on the other end, I, I still think we are working towards the overall goal. You mentioned increments. Um, you know, the considerations don't stop here. I had... Um, a resident reached out to me a while back saying, well, why, why is it just you guys are just looking at this particular site when it comes to affordability? Well, the short answer is we're not. Um, there's a bunch of, of potential sites we're trying to review and see if there's you know, an affordable housing opportunity. There could even be some pieces of town-owned land that in the future could afford some level of affordability. So you know, we are looking through this lens town-wide and not just specific to one development. Um, I'm confident that other sites will yield other results, some better, some around the same, maybe some not at all. But again, I, I think, you know, to your point, we are looking at opportunities where we can and where it makes sense, locationally speaking, and, you know, with respect to a variety of other factors to incorporate these affordability measures. So while I, I get your point about the unit reduction, uh, be rest assured that we are looking at the town fulsomely and looking at trying to leverage other opportunities where we see them. Thank you very much, Mr. Bruder. Mr. Chairman, uh, just like we have all been able to put our issues on the table this evening and everyone has received a balanced response, I want to thank Mr. Bruder for that. And let's hope that we can all remember what we've all had to say tonight because all of our issues are very, very important to somebody somewhere in this community. Thank you very much. Thanks, Your Worship. Vice Chairman, you're, you're okay? Okay, three, three, yes. So hold me to task. So thank you very much, and, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, go to page 33 um, of the report. So and this, you know what? It's in the staff report, but this might be um, a question more directed to Mr. Toth. So if you could just kind of nod. So maybe it's not a question to staff. So I'm a, so um, we're talking. Yeah. So I, yeah, I get that, but it's in the staff report. So give me a little leeway because I'm the chair. So there's going to be a warning clause um, on the cottage style units. Um, typically that um, there's registered on title that there's two parking spaces available. Um, so kind of directing people to that. And then on blocks one and two, um, there'll be more than two parking spaces. So wondering if and this is kind of a question going out to both. Wondering if that will be highlighted as well. So maybe with potential buyers, a question will be asked, how many vehicles do you have? Would you direct them to the ones uh, that allow for more parking um, to kind of cut off the issue of on-street parking? So, you know, um, you know, families moving in, couple teenagers or or that are, that'll be driving vehicles at some point is that is that a is that a discussion that happens through mr chair why don't, why don't i take okay. a stab at that it does um, usually it's required to be included we we have clauses in our site plan agreements it's got to be in the purchase and sale agreement okay. um, the amount of especially you know when you're talking about and we've heard this many times and again i know it's not the exact answer everyone wants to hear but the truth is uh, the parking spaces in the garages are counted, mm -hmm. typically. You're right, some of, the, some of the dwellings along the perimeter have more than two spaces by virtue of a longer driveway. Yeah. Some of the cottage-style units interior have a little bit less. All that it, information is provided right at the outset. I'm, I'm looking at Drew, but that's what happens <laughs> when, they're, when they're sold. So uh, to, to your question, just on a high level, yes, that okay. information is provided. Okay. That's good. okay. So now on, on page 39 of the report, we talk about, and we've talked about it a, a number of times, the surface and the subsurface water runoff, and that it's going to be contained um, within buried tanks that are going to be within the infrastructure. Um, and you know what? Looking at the, looking at the diagram of the, of the uh, proposed subdivision, I mean, the um, group behind our urban tree canopy should be very happy because of the number of trees going in, uh, boulevard trees. So wondering, again, if we're gonna contain all of that water underground and then release it slowly to the two storm retention ponds, 
Has there been any thought to utilizing, based on the number of trees that are there, uh, we want them to survive? The Silva cells that we had contemplated or the newer technology that uh, VRIC came up with that we're using in um, Jordan, right? To slow release to these trees a surface to actually feed them. Through you, Mr. Chair, good, good ideas for sure. I think it's always worth considering how you can implement types of low impact development and especially trying to ensure and enhance the survival of the street trees. Silva cells in particular might be a little bit too big for the right of way for the boulevards, yep. but you do bring up a good point from a, a water perspective, what can be done to, uh, to kind of use it on site and maybe use it as a benefit in certain instances. So that, that would be something that we would explore. Okay, thank you. Because I go, I go back to Liz Bennion's, um presentation and, and you know that when a subdivision goes in that the trees have a two-year warranty but it's not about replacing the trees after two years if they don't take because you've lost two years in the growth cycle so we want them to take right away whether it's gator bags whether it, whatever is out there we want them to catch we want them to to grow and prosper all right so anything that we could look at to that, well, I would appreciate that, so. Yeah, and, and, and good points, Mr. Chair. And I can tell you too, just as by virtue of our Urban Tree Canopy Working Group, we're looking at strengthening some clauses in our site plan and subdivision agreements, um, providing more teeth and more of a, a watering schedule to ensure that um, developers are a little more diligent through the, the initial processes and in trying to achieve that, which is the trees uh, at a much higher survival rate. Okay, terrific. And my third question, Vice Chair Murray, um, so on the diagram, uh, Appendix A of the report. So the developer is um, doing um, uh, traffic calming measures at Edward and Hope, um, Edward Bush and Street A, and then Street A and Hope, correct? That's what those pink uh, notations are on the, on the diagram? Yeah, through you, to you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, those are some of the raised um, crossings talked about, but there's going to be future tra or additional traffic calming too, just what I talked about before, some of the other measures. Well, right? see, that's where I want to go to. So, yeah. I, and, I, and I want to thank, I want to thank yourself. Um, I want to thank Mr. Workington. I want to thank Mr. Graham. I want to thank our CAO who uh, met with Councillor Brunet and myself on, on site on Thursday. You know, going back to that initial thought of why can't the existing driveway be used? And, um, you know, uh, Rick and Wilma Borger came out and joined in our discussion and we talked about Edward Street and the urbanization. And at that point, we talked about um, a three-way stop or an all-way stop at Edward and Cherrywood. And, and Steph said, yeah, that's what, we would look at that. So, and we also talked about possibly something at Hickson and, and um, Cherrywood because uh, Director Graham, we received those um, emails last week about traffic calming on Hickson. We had talked about <coughs> timing those with the upgrade of the sewer, but now because of our I and I work, we don't have to do that. And, and just going through the documentation and, and looking at it, and and I think there's an opportunity too for traffic calming and and a raised crosswalk at Hope and Ashby. I go back to Rittenhouse. I mean, Rittenhouse now has become, in my estimation, our gold standard. Did we miss on the multi-use trail? Yeah, we did, and I'm always gonna bring that up. But I think, did it slow traffic down and did it allow facilitation of pedestrians? Yes. So if we want the new residents to access Ashby Park, um, I think a raised crosswalk at Hope and Ashby um, much like on Rittenhouse, would facilitate that safe movement and, and add a little more extra to it. So just wanted to get your thoughts on that because, you know, you guys committed to, to the others and, and Councilor Brittany and, and I both appreciate that. But I just, you know, I thought we can't miss out on this. So, Mr. Graham. Uh, thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> great suggestion. I, I think, you know, we'll take that back with, uh, with the design team and, and take a look at that. Um, we definitely want to look at how we can safely, you know, have pedestrians get over to the park area. So 
that's a great suggestion. So let us take that back to see what we can do there. Okay, C terrific. Because we've got something similar uh, in front of uh, Hillary Ballpark, right? With the with the raised and 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 it's painted green and and whether that becomes uh, something we institute across the town, where we know that that colored pavement marking is access to a park. Um, I go to our um, uh, age friendly and um, Active, trans active Transportation Committee, Joint Committee. I think that that's something that will come out of that. So thank you, Vice Chair Murray, for indulging me. Councilor Brene. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Appreciate the opportunity to ask some additional questions. So you kind of stole my thunder. I just kind of come at it from a little bit different angle. So on the uh, conditions of draft approval, <laughs> um, number 16 under land dedications and easements, we say that the owner shall grant all easements and land conveyances required for public access to Block 9 and a public walkway within Block 1. So, uh, you know, Councillor Patriva eloquently described this. I'm just going to come at it from a different angle. We always talk about connectivity and we talk about active transportation. There were some councillors tonight that justified that the green space within this development was sufficient because Ashby Park and Prokich Park are within walking distance. So let's make sure that we adequately provide the appropriate walkways um, to get people from Hickson Street into in, across Hickson and across Edward and across from Ashby, um, you know, because, you know, we say we, we want to have safe, you know, there's, there's children, you, you, uh, d Director Graham, Walter Neubauer walked up there on, uh, on Bush, a couple of years ago, we watched one afternoon, we stood there, the amount of children walking from Jacob Beam School and St. Mark's School coming back into that area, it's astonishing. So we have a walkway there where we put gates because there was actually people, believe it or not, driving vehicular vehicles on that walkway where kids were walking. So if we're going to talk about active transportation, we're going to talk about safety, let's make sure that we, we ensure that those connections from Edward and 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 um, Hickson into into Block Nine and from Ashby and Ho and Hope are done appropriately. So uh, I, I just want to emphasize that from an active transportation, a connectivity, and a safety standpoint. Um, thank you, Chair. I hope you don't you don't count that as number one. Um, so so I just want to go back to um, the developer stock talked about. Um, the pop space at 330 square meters and we're going to have a, an active discussion about what the amenities look like and he assured us tonight that it won't be just a green space um, but through you chair I'm wondering if someone on staff can talk about okay in some way shape or form we're going to do something to develop this whether it's a, uh, a gazebo a gazebo Mr. Toth or some some uh, other features, but is there um, cash in lieu coming back to the town above and beyond this? I don't believe we've talked about that. Through you, Mr. Chair, I haven't done the calculations yet. Usually those are done later, but yeah, there, there would be some cash in lieu coming for sure. And just to follow up on that question on that, so if that money flows through to the town, where will that money be directed? Through you, Mr. Chair, it, I think really, you know, there's analysis done for the overall parkland dedication fund. We look at what the needs are in the community um, with certain open spaces that we have. I think generally speaking, you know, you, you target where those needs are and that's where the funds are allocated. Um, but other than that, I don't have a, a specific list of priorities at my fingertips at the moment on where it would go. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, thank you Director Bruder. So, Chair, I would like to ask a question of our CAO. At the end of the day, I think uh, the buck stops with our CAO here as, uh, as all these reports flow through. So one of the questions that uh, Councillor Pachereva and I received, and this is not, not unique to Lincoln, in any way, shape, or form is this unique to Lincoln, but I received a comment from someone where the report was stating that the rental apartment will have access to the medical services pointing towards the Hickson Street Medical Center. So in other words, you know, people are just going to have to walk down the street, you know, from the apartment and, and get medical care. The problem being, the reality is, the Hickson Street Medical Center hasn't accepted new patients since 2020. 
We've been hearing in the community a need for a daycare, and thankfully the Calvary Gospel Church is putting an addition and an expansion on there. But I'm wondering through you, Chair, to the CAO, what, what, what do you say to a resident that asks, why does this council and staff continue to allow development to occur when we don't have the proper services to support our existing res residents, never mind the new residents that will be moving to Lincoln? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, it's not an easy answer, Councillor, and, and I know you and I have chatted about this in the past. I guess, you know, what I would say to that is, and we're working with the numerous medical facilities, Council will be aware. Uh, there's one further down on Ontario Street that we've identified some property with uh, for daycare and more health care options. Uh, there is a build it and you will come or saying no for, for the purposes of, of you know, having medical doctors not in the community is, is not really a rationale that staff look at. Um, you're right, this isn't a problem that we're just facing here in Lincoln. It's a problem across the province. Uh, we look at the provincial government increasing medical doctor spaces. We look at the incentives a lot of municipalities here in Niagara are providing. Welland, Fort Erie provide significant dollars to attract uh, medical professionals. Lincoln does have uh, a shortage. We're about three doctors short. When you look at across uh, Niagara region, uh, a lot of other communities have numbers that are extremely uh, larger than, than our shortage. I would say on the daycare, we've got some definite plans. We're looking at BDSS. We are looking at the existing daycare that's in that particular location that you know very well. Uh, and you know, when we think about the expansion that they're looking to do, they put money aside for that expansion. I think we'll address it. On the medical care, uh, that one's a little tougher to answer. Uh, and I think as I've highlighted, we've got health care options both at BDSS and the court hold court holding property that I hope come to fruition in the near future. But, you know, to suggest that one needs to say no uh, when there aren't amenities, uh, I think is tough. We share this data with the region uh, who is in the business of physician recruitment. I think about the Catholic school coming on Green Lane. That's a result of the uh, information sharing that we're doing with the school board. So uh, what we do is share information. Economic development is out there uh, working with a number of these groups trying to bring them to our community. Um, and so, you know, I think that's, that's my answer. I don't have a perfect answer for you, uh, but saying no because there aren't enough doctors in the community when this is a nationwide crisis, we're not gonna solve here in Lincoln. So residents may not like that answer. Uh, people may not like that answer, but that isn't a reason to say no to a development. And I'd encourage that resident to, to reach out and we can have a further conversation on some of the global issues that we're facing and the Canadian issues, let alone the provincial issues. Chair, I have one final question, if you could just uh, bear with me. So again, through you to the CAO. So Mr. Kirkopoulos, we've gone back, uh, you know, for the last two or three weeks about this water issue. It's, for me, one of the biggest things. Uh, you know, for me, to, for me to support this application, I need to know that I have the faith and staff in you uh, to, to directly um, ensure that this is going to be adequately um, dealt with. So we have uh, Jillian Harris on our staff. She's an Associate Director of Public Works and has a water background. And she responded to an email and you were copied on that. I'm wondering if just for the public you could elaborate on that as pop possibly a provision that can be put in this uh, application uh, or if you could expand on that. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and thanks to the Council for bringing it up. Uh, it is something that we spoke about extensively, uh, and I was going to raise it, but I'm glad you asked it, Councillor. We talked about, um, as you said, some of the concerns we're getting, some of the complaints we're getting from residents, uh, and one of the potential solutions that was highlighted <coughs> was um, to have a requirement in the investigation report that specifically addresses existing groundwater conditions, potential impacts to the proposed development and neighboring properties, and potential mitigation measures. So definitely going above and beyond what is typically in these investigation reports. And so uh, either we take it as direction from council, uh, or you can more, more formalize it if you would like, but I would suggest to you uh, that be a specific requirement. And so uh, I connected with Jillian this evening as well as Director Graham, uh, and they are both uh, supportive of us continuing with this potential solution. So 
Rest assured, we also talked about peer reviews. We talked about hiring our own independent consultant. Uh, but we are comfortable with uh, putting in this provision uh, regarding the investigation report, specifically addressing these four uh, conditions and measures. So I appreciate that very much. I think, um, you know, someone mentioned to me over the last few weeks that probably in a lifetime, uh, the biggest investment uh, a person makes is in his home. And a person should not live in fear of a flooded basement or, or the fear of the unknown. So I think this would go a long way. So I'm just wondering through you, Chair, uh, whether you need a direction, whether you need a motion, you know, what are the next steps? You've, you've indicated publicly that uh, that's something we could entertain. What, what are the next steps? Um, do you need direction or how so, is? So through you, Mr. Chair, to, you know, to you and, the, and our clerk, I'll look. Uh, if you determine anything's more required, I would tell you we said it publicly in front of residents. Staff are well aware of it, uh, so we can take it as direction, but um, either or I'm comfortable with. Through you, Chair, I would prefer a motion be put on the floor and that be, be voted on by council. I'll send you the wording. Thank you. Through you, Chair, if you don't mind, I will put the, the motion up and read it. Okay. Give me a second. I need... So, Councillor Bernay, I will have you move that motion. And I will cast it now, and that motion reads that... Um, I have a requirement in the investigation report that specifically addresses existing groundwater conditions, potential impacts to the proposed development, and neighboring pro uh, properties and potential mitigation measures. So if all, all is okay, I'd like to open that vote. Councillor Bernay, if you're comfortable with that. Yeah. Okay. Council, you're okay with that? Yeah, there's probably some, you know, wordsmithing. Wordsmithing, exactly. Well, Madam Clerk's an expert at that, so a where to or, a where, you know, whereby. No problem. Okay. N no problem, Chair. I did put Excellent. The, the general gist is there, correct? correct? Okay. Okay. And if you're comfortable with me opening that vote, Open thank that you. vote, please, yes. Mayor Easton, may I have your vote for the um, mm -hmm. addition? Of that clause, I support the uh, the motion. Thank you. Thank you. No problem, Councillor Bernay. I'll take your vote verbally if you don't mind. Support. In support. Thank you. And I'll close that motion, and that carries. Okay. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor, for bringing that forward. Uh, Vice Chair, I just have two quick ones. If I may, thank you. So, so you can time me. So, and, and Councilor Bernay, uh, you know, we were talking today, and he brought up the cash and Lou, and you know, him and I both had the um, opportunity and pleasure to be at the opening of Prokich Park. That we waited a heck of a long time to open, but you know what? When when we opened it right away, we had identified it's a 10-acre park. You know, deficiency of swing sets and and things like that, and. Knowing that we've got Ashby Prokich and Cherry Heights, um, and, and I don't know if this is a question to um, our Director of Community Services or maybe a finance question, but um, you know we always talk about growth paying for growth. So here's a here's a a prime example of you know development coming in cash and lieu, and I think it should be directed to amenities in those parks if that's what we're directing the residents to use those parks. Can we do that rather than just throw it in a catch-all? I know our parks master plan has identified deficiencies so though in those, so just want to get your thoughts. Is that, it's, it's almost like the, um, the um, snowfall reserve. 
So actually rather, they're like earmarking it to a need. And I think it just would, would show confidence that you know what, we're, we're doing what we're saying. Right, if we, if we want those parks to be used, we need to have the, the equipment in them. So, Ms. McKay, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts? Through you, Chair, or to you, Chair. Um, I think we have a Parks and Rec and Culture Master Plan that have a number of recommendations that we are still working through and we do have deficiencies in a number of areas across town. Um, I would say finishing parks is important as well. As council is aware, we didn't have enough funds in the Ashby uh, cash and loot to rubberize the equipment, uh, fitness equipment area. So, you know, that's an example of potentially what it could be used for. I don't know because the calculations have not yet been done what that is. And I guess it's up to council if they want to try and um, identify specifically which parks. I can't speak on behalf of the treasurer though. So I don't know, I mean, typically those funds would go into the reserve fund and would be used. Um, you know, when we, when we come to council with a capital project related to parks, we don't say these funds came from <laughs> and therefore we're gonna use them in this area. But do we have, would we like to do more in those two spaces? We would. Would we like to do more across town? We would. So. And thank you for that. And it's just, it's just you know what, and, and I always come to you at, at budget time with a wish list. And, and, you know, and you've been great on, you know, the water filling stations and um, the screening on the pickleball courts. And, and, and like you say, we, we wanted to rubberize that, that surface. And, and I just think it's an opportunity to actually be able to earmark those funds for completing. And I see um, Mrs. Tunicitis is on there. So I mean, from a, from a financial aspect and, and uh, you know, if, if it's doable, and I'm not asking for an answer in, in concrete tonight, but just, is there a chance? That's what I'm asking. That's all I'm asking for. There's always a chance. <laughs> okay, you, that's, that's all I ask. So through you, Chair, um, you know, the so far the Director of Planning and the Director of Community Services have answered accurately that it goes into a general reserve fund account. And then there's a requirement now under legislation that we allocate 60% of that to projects in our forecast at a minimum. So we're always looking at the forecast and making sure that we have allocated it to accounts. So right now, most of it is uh, spoken for in the forecast, but you know, once it's collected, it goes into that reserve fund and then we can evaluate what projects would be uh, best suited for that. And that's always subject to council at budget time. Okay. Thank you very much for that. So Councilor Brene, come budget. Need you, we, we gotta, we gotta push forward on this. So one last question, and I know it's probably at, at it gonna be answered at site plan. Uh, but it was raised tonight with issues of construction and all that. Will we have a dedicated project manager to address issues arising um, with the build? And, and I know this is one of my you know, pet peeves where, you know what, we talk about construction starting at 7 a.m. So if we have a de dedicated PM, you know what, one day he might be there at 6.30 to ensure that uh, construction isn't started by 7. And then he'll be there at night one night to make sure that the road's not dry swept and creating something like Dust Bowl, Arizona, that actually water's put down, the road is cleaned properly. You know, if, if anything's come up with, with the uh, integration and the upgrading of Edward, you know, curb cuts and things like that, that, you know what, uh, we're gonna be impacting the end of your driveway. If you have a trailer and you're planning on going away for the weekend, We'd ask you to move it out, things like that. So just wondering if there's going to be someone dedicated to this project, knowing that it's an infill and it's going to impact a heck of a lot of residents. Through you, Mr. Chair. Good question. Um, I think generally speaking from a resource standpoint now, we probably wouldn't have that capability to dedicate someone solely for this project. But um, I think generally speaking in the area, this isn't the only 
prospective development that's happening. So if you're asking me, are we going to spend extra attention here because this is where we see things happening, I would say yes. If there's further resource allocations that need to be considered, um, I think that's a conversation we can have internally. But um, generally speaking, I do recognize that there has been uh, overall just construction happening in the area for quite some time, and it needs to be effectively managed. So okay. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Chair Murray. Okay. So I see no further questions. I have a motion moved by Councillor Reimer. The committee approve official plan amendment application PL0, PLOPA 20230111 and zoning bylaw amendment PLZBA 20230 112 in the name of Better Neighborhoods Incorporated, Elevate Living, Pine Glen Beamsville Incorporated, and Trustees of Calvary Gospel Church, subject to the following conditions. Number one, that a holding H provision be placed on the zoning of the land subject to R2-39, R2-40, R2-41, RM1-38, RM1-39, RM1-40, RM1-41, and RM1-42 zoning designations, and that the holding H provision not be removed until the following conditions are first completed to the satisfaction of the Director of Planning of the Town of Lincoln. A, that the applicant has entered into a subdivision agreement and condominium agreement, and the agreements are registered on title. B, the applicant has submitted the letter of credit and cash payments required by the agreements. C, sufficient wa wastewater services are or will be available to accommodate the proposed development to the satisfaction of the region of Niagara and the town of Lincoln. And D, the applicant has completed the primary services within the subdivision. Number two, that a holding H provision be placed on the zoning of the land subject to the RM3-4 zoning designation and that the holding H provision not be removed until the following conditions are first completed to the satisfaction of the Director of Planning of the Town of Lincoln. The applicant has entered into a site plan agreement and the agreement has been registered on title. B, the applicant has submitted the letter of credit and cash payments required by the agreements. C, sufficient Weiss water services are or will be available to accommodate the proposed development to the satisfaction of the region of Niagara and the town of Lincoln. And D, the applicant has entered into an affordable and attainable housing agreement with the town and the agreement has been registered on title. This agreement shall require the following. One, that a minimum of 11% of the total units have monthly rents which meet the definition of affordable as provided in the Niagara Region Official Plan. And in addition, two, that a minimum of 32% of the total units has monthly rents which meet the definition of attainable as provided in the Niagara Region Official Plan. And three, that the housing units shall have a minimum period of affordability that shall not be less than 25 years in length. Council enact and pass the official plan amendment as attached as Appendix C of the report, PD 25-23, to amend the official plan policies for the subject lands. Committee enact and pass zoning bylaw amendment as attached as Appendix D of report, PD 13-14, to amend the zoning regulations for the subject lands. Committee deem that zoning bylaw conforms to the official plan for the Town of Lincoln, and committee approve draft plan of subdivision application, PLSUB 202 30113, in the name of Better Neighborhoods Incorporated, Elevate Living, Pine Glen Beamsville Incorporated, and Trustees of Calvary Gospel Church. In accordance with the plan outlined in Appendix A, and in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act, and the regula regulations thereunder, subject to the conditions outlined in Appendix F. That all parties be advised that committee decision on behalf on the draft plan of subdivision application, in accordance with the provincial regulations. Note, the appeal period is 20 days from the notice of decision. The Director of Planning and Development be authorized to endorse the draft plan as approved 20 days after notice of committee's decision has been given, provided that no appeals against the decision have been lodged. That the applicant be advised that the draft approval of this plan will lapse three years from the date of draft approval unless the Town Council grants an extension of the approval period. If an extension is requested, an updated review and revisions to the conditions of draft approval may be necessary at that time. Committee declare that they have considered all of the written and oral submissions and agrees with the planning report analysis and recommendations and finds that subject to the conditions of approval, this application meets the Planning Act criteria, is consistent with the provincial policy statement and complies with the growth plan, the Niagara Region official plan and the town official plan. I will now ask your deputy clerk to open the vote. 
Thank you, Chair. That vote is now open. Mayor Easton, may I have your vote, please? I support. Thank you. And I'm going to close that vote. And that motion carries, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Devan. So we will now... Con yeah, uh, yes, I was just looking at that. So yes, so now that we've, before we go into the um, development charges review, let's, let's have a 10 minute break so we could, five, okay, Councilor Russell, bit of a taskmaster, five minutes. So, no, no, we need five because there might be a lineup. So, okay, thank you.
Oh, can we do an extend beyond the hour? Oh. Consider item 7.2.3 report PD 15-24 regarding development charge review and we have a presentation from Byron Tan of Watson and Associates Economists Limited. Prior to proceeding with the presentation, the Director of Planning and Development will provide inter introductory comments. Mr. Bruder, please go ahead. Are we, we may not have to. Okay. Oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just, just really, I'll be very brief, just a couple of comments. Again, when we look at this, I want everyone to, to just understand that this is not, you know, this isn't a situation where, you know, arbitrary numbers are picked. There's a whole science that goes behind these figures, looking at what our growth projections are, what the servicing needs are to accommodate that development or to service it. And now looking out over a longer time period than we ever had to before. It used to be five years, now it's 10 years. So again, I just, I, I think generally speaking, um, it's important to highlight that again, it's, it's something that all town departments are involved in when we look at this and we look at the types of projects and things that are needed. So that's really the only point I wanted to make heading into Byron's presentation. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Bruder. Byron, go ahead. Perfect. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, good evening uh, members of the committee and uh, members of the public. I'm happy to be here today uh, to provide you with a recap of the development charge process. Uh, as you recall, I was here uh, basically just a little bit over a month ago uh, to undertake the public meeting process. And today I'm here just to provide you a little bit of a background and a refresher of what's transpired to date. And obviously looking forward at the timelines uh, over the next couple of weeks. Oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> uh, so in terms of uh, the agenda, I mean, again, uh, most of it is a recap. So we'll recap the timelines, uh, the legislative impact. Again, I won't go through much detail, but at least give you a little bit of a refresher of, uh, you know, what has transpired from your previous DC till now uh, from a legislative standpoint. Uh, we'll give you a little bit of a summary on the developer engagement uh, that's transpired since the public meeting. Uh, you may have received a staff report uh, that outlined those uh, questions as well as responses, so I'll just touch upon that. And then again, uh, recapping on the calculations, the policies, and as well providing you with the survey of DCs within the Niagara region. So again, just to recap the study process and timelines, we started back in February of 2023. Again, it was an extended process working with town staff as well as council uh, to develop the calculations, policies, capital infrastructure, and growth forecasts that would feed into the, the background study. Uh, we did work to release the background study on December 22nd, 2023, and we um, also had uh, an addendum subsequent to that, and I'll touch upon that in a moment, uh, that amended a couple of items with respect to water and wastewater. Uh, subsequent to the release of the addendum, we did have a stakeholder meeting or a meeting with the development community uh, to provide them with a background and the process of the development charges. And then we also had the public meeting of council back on February 20th. Now, subsequent to this, there was a meeting with the uh, with town staff, with the uh, Niagara Home Builders Association, or at least some of the development community. So I'll touch upon that in a moment. And we are here today, obviously, uh, for you to receive the DC study staff report and this presentation. And we're looking for a council to consider the bylaw on April 15th. So again, just to go through a quick recap of the legislation, again, most of these uh, pieces of, uh, of uh, legislation has been incorporated in your prior DC study um, when we undertook your 2022 update. So that's in the form of Bill 108, 138, 197, and 213. Again, timing of provision payments, uh, installment payments, uh, et cetera. Subsequent to that, as part of this DC round, uh, we have incorporated all of the exemptions, reductions, administrative changes, and policies from Bill 23. Uh, as well as any of the amendments uh, that came forth from Bill 134, which included an income qualifier to the uh, affordable housing, which again is still not in effect yet until the province releases their bulletin and the, uh, the regulations associated with it. 
Uh, as I mentioned, we did release an addendum report subsequent to the uh, background study. So on February 9th, we released uh, an addendum that revised the water and wastewater calculations. Uh, with respect to the water, we updated one of the listings, uh, which was Main Street. And then for wastewater, there was a capital project that was um, you know, included uh, where it, when it shouldn't have. So those made some adjustments slightly where it increased the water DC. Um, you know, by a marginal amount, and then the wastewater DC uh, was decreased uh, by roughly $450. So subsequent to the public meeting, uh, as I mentioned, the, the town held an engagement, um, you know, with the Niagara Home Builders Association. So this is in addition to the February 14th uh, stakeholder meeting. Uh, where additional questions and answers you know, were provided, so additional dialogue. Uh, again, the summary of those questions that were received uh, would have been included as part of uh, the town's uh, staff report, and you, sh you all should have been uh, privy to that information. In terms of your current development charges, uh, again, just to reiterate, uh, right now you are currently charging uh, about $35,900 for a single detached home. As the units, uh, you know, decrease in size, the uh, you know the related charge associated with them, as you can see, has is decreasing, all the way down to about twelve thousand one hundred dollars for a special care special dwelling. Similarly, you also provide uh, area specific uh, charges for Camden. From a non-residential standpoint, you can see the development charges that you're currently imposing. Uh, again, from a you know per square meter basis or per square foot. Uh, you're about $233 and change for commercial, uh, about $97 uh, per square meter for industrial, and $166 for institutional. The square footage calculations are on the left-hand side for you to look at. In terms of your uh, policies, uh, these are your existing DC ex uh, discretionary exemptions. Um, you know, through discussions with staff, we are proposing that they uh, be continued. If there are any changes or any items that uh, council wishes, uh, you, know, you have the opportunity to do so prior to uh, passing the bylaw. But these are currently the ones that are included in your bylaw, in your uh, draft bylaw that's uh, being considered for April fifteenth. In terms of the calculated residential developments, again, uh, as per the addendum, as you can see here, we are now moving up to about forty-four thousand one hundred thirty-eight for singles. And again, the charge does go down depending on the unit size. So with the special care being about 16,900. And again, a recalculation of your uh, Camden area specific charge. And I do have a footnote here that all of these charges are subject to the mandatory phase in from Bill 23. From non-residential, as I mentioned, uh, we do have uh, similar charges, also one with primary now. Um, where commercial, as you can see here, all in would be about three hundred and ten dollars uh, and ninety-seven cents per uh, square meter, one hundred and twenty-nine for industrial and two hundred and thirty for in institutional. In terms of a uh, comparison, as you can see right now, your current charges all in uh, within the urban areas is about thirty-five thousand nine hundred and fifty-four. With the addendum's calculation, we're now at forty-four thousand one thirty-eight. However, with the mandatory phase in, in year one of your bylaw, that amount would actually be a maximum of 35,310. So just slightly under your current DCs uh, that you're imposing today. From a non-residential standpoint, as you can see the charges uh, listed above, I apologize for the size. But essentially with the 80% phase in, uh, your um, commercial, industrial, and institutional would be slightly higher than what you're currently charging um, today for your uh, current bylaw. And with the respect with the comparators for other municipalities, uh, the two green ones, um, so you'll see the, the very dark green on the left-hand side, that is the calculated uh, Lincoln rate. Uh, the one that's not as uh, darkly shaded, that's your current rates. And the pink actually represents what your charge will be uh, should you enact the bylaw um, you know, with the 80% phase in, assuming no further reductions to the calculations. And just want to point out that everything with the star notated, not, notated at the bottom of these graphs represent municipalities that are either currently undertaking or will be undertaking their development charges. So there will be some shifts to this uh, graph uh, over the next um, you know, months. In terms of commercial, same idea. Uh, the dark green represents the calculated. Uh, the light uh, green or teal is your current. And the, uh, the pink there is the calculated 80% phase in. 
Same idea with industrial. Again, uh, this is for uh, council's review. This was presented during the public meeting. And finally, with next steps, as I mentioned, uh, you are here to receive the DC study and staff report, and we'll be here for council's consideration of the bylaw on April 15th. And that concludes my presentation. Excellent, Byron. Thank you very much. Any questions from committee? To Mr. Tan. Okay. I should have known. Councillor McCulloch. Just um, with respect to um, the, f I feel like there, there there's um, there's going to be possibly developers that are going to take out DC charges uh, in the near future to lock them in at the current rate. And I'm trying to get clarification, but my e-scribe just uh, closed and is reopening. Um, I need some explanation on that uh, two year, that one year. What is the timeline for locking in rates, freezing in rates, as far as the, um, the date of um, taking them out? And it, it seems a little a little unclear to me about the one year from this and uh, within two years of that. No, uh, great question uh, through the chair. Uh, so the way the rate freezes work, and again, this was introduced through Bill 108, which was taken into account from your previous DC study in 2022. So the way it, the, the triggers are, if there is a site plan application or zoning bylaw amendment, that um, when staff uh, deem the application to be uh, approved and complete, that's when the two-year um, timeline starts ticking. So, you know, right now, if for some, if for an example, there's a developer that came in with a completed site plan application that you've approved, then they would be subject to the rates that are currently imposed today. So prior to even the new consideration of the new bylaw, and that would be in pl they would be allowed then to pull a building permit within a two-year period, subject to the current rates that are frozen. Now. With Bill 108, you are allowed to impose interest rates, uh, interest costs to those on an annual basis. So, you know, right now you, the prescribed rates are prime plus 1%. So whatever those rates uh, end up being uh, and from a dollar perspective, that can then be added on to whatever the frozen rates are now. If they don't, um, you know, put in a complete application until, say, post April 15th, when your bylaw may be, your new bylaw may be in place, then those rates would be in effect at that point in time. And again, it is up to two years. So the moment they're at two years and one day, they would be uh, subject to whatever current uh, rates are at that time with the full indexing that has occurred over those two year period. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and then uh, another question, um, trying to be quick, as with regards to Camden, there's this extra charge for Camden, and uh, it's going to be for another 10 years. I'm not familiar with what happened in Camden, when it happened, or what is this extra charge that Camden's facing, and how long does this go? Yep, forever? No, um, forever? <laughs> I, I don't know. So uh, through the chair, uh, great question. So your Camden um, waste uh, stormwater drainage charge actually is the recovery of a piece of infrastructure that the town had put in historically. I believe this dates back to maybe 2009 or even earlier. So at that time, uh, there was, uh, again, infrastructure that was uh, basically constructed by the town, and it was meant to service a set number of uh, single detached homes, or at least single detached equivalents. So what this charge is representing is that, you know, as that area builds out that would have been, um, you know, would have benefited from that piece of infrastructure, they are paying towards that to pay yourselves back for that investment. So once all of those units have been built in that area, then this charge really, um, you know, goes away. It's only meant to uh, recover for that piece of infrastructure that you have invested in uh, historically. Uh, follow up, do we have an idea when that might be? Uh, I would defer this to the planners on when the uh, growth would occur within Cam in that Camden area. Mr. Graham, would you have a, an answer on that? And that was and to Councillor Miklux, that, so that was a special area charge that we yeah. imposed, yeah. right? So it's just on those those homes and the new ones being built. But uh, between Mr. Graham and Mr. Bruder, do you have a definitive answer for Councilor uh, McClough? Three, Mr. Chair, maybe I'll make a comment and Director Bruder may have something more to add. It really depends on the ultimate build out of Camden. Um, I don't know, Matt, if you have anything more to add in terms of timing, but. 
Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, just generally speaking, I know that for the most part, a lot of our bigger development sites are either being developed now, there's one in Campton on the east end that just went through a draft plan process, hasn't initiated detailed design, that one could take quite some time. Um, I think actually too, there's a little bit of confusion as to what this is for, because I think what Byron was talking about is actually the sanitary piece, which that's that's been completed. We are no longer charging for that. This is actually for the storm infrastructure. And what's going to happen is as development occurs, when it's all done, specifically this piece to the east, all the stormwater drainage in Campton, there's going to be a conveyance system going east and there's supposed to be re uh, retention infrastructure there. I would suspect though to fulfill that or to, to, to for all that to be completed, we're five plus years out, I would probably say, okay. estimating. Okay, thank you. Okay, there being no further discussion, I've got a motion moved by Councillor Reimer. The committee approve report PD 15-24 regarding the development charge review, and that committee, A, whenever appropriate, requests that grants, subsidies, and other contributions be clearly designated by the donor as being to the benefit of existing developments or new development at, at new development as applicable. B, adopt the assumptions contained herein as an anticipation with respect to capital gains, subsidies, and other contributions. C, continue the development charge approach to calculate the charges on a uniform townwide basis for all services except water, wastewater, and stormwater services. D, continue the development charge approach to calculate the charges on an urban area basis for water, wastewater, and stormwater services. E, continue the development charge approach to calculate the charges on an area-specific basis for stormwater services in the area of Camden. F, approve the capital projects listed as set out in Chapter 5 of the Development Charges Background Study Consolidated Report, dated March 22, 2024, subject to further annual review during the capital budget process. G, Approve the Development Charges Background Study Consolidated Report dated March 22, 2024, as set out in Appendix A. H. Has determined that no further public meeting is required. I. Approve the Development Charge Bylaws as set out in Appendix B. That the Development Charges in Appendix B be effective April 30, 2024, and then indexed by 6.57%, the 2024 rates effective June 1, 2024. I will now ask our deputy clerk to open the vote. Thank you, Chair. That vote's now open. And Mayor Easton, may I get your vote, please? Um, Madam Chair, um, I have a, I had a, a question on this. Are we going to entertain questions on this um, motion? Through you, I can, I, Chair, I can cancel the vote if you'd like to take the question. Well. Okay. Well, we did entertain questions earlier, Your Worship. So, I, were, did you have your hand up? Did we not see you? No. It's just that I was surprised when I saw the detail of um, all the um, the parts to this, and I'm unclear on um, what item C means. Okay. So let's field that question. So, uh, Director Bruder. So let me be very specific. Yeah. Does item C, Mr. Chairman, mean that we are going to consider additional area rating in the future? Because that's what it looks like. Just bear with me one second, Mr. Chair. You got I'm just it. getting to it here. Through you, Mr. Chair, if I if I could maybe yes, well, I think both, yes. both Byron and I are looking at each other, saying that's not what C no. infers. So to put the mayor's mind at ease, we are not suggesting uh, that that would infer an area rating approach. Okay. Uh, if we wanted to do something like that, it would be something that we would bring back to council. Okay. Okay. So what does item C mean, Mr. Bruder? Have you got enough time on that, or do we need to we need to stretch? Three, Mr. Chair, if we're talking about, I think what we're talking about is item C in the recommendation section at the beginning of the report, report, correct, Your Worship? I'm talking about item C in the motion. Yeah, so it looks like here um, we're looking at uh, continuing the approach to calculate charges on a uniform townwide basis for all services except water, wastewater, and storm, which is, again, part, of, part and parcel of the Campton discussion as well. So... That's just to reinforce the point that our CAO just made. Uniform, okay. correct. All right. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, but I haven't 
I had not seen that motion, and so um, I had concerns. Thank you for your consideration. Yeah, no worries. No worries at all. Are you you're you're comfortable now, Your Worship? Yes. Okay. Yes, you can proceed with the vote. Thank you, Chair. And with that, I'll ask the remaining members of council to vote if you have not already. And Mayor Easton, may I have your vote, please? Uh, in support. Thank you. I don't have it. Councilor Regima? I'm clicking yes. And then okay. Thank you. And I will close that vote. And that motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Okay, there was, yeah, because uh, Councillor Timmer's left. Yes. She's, she's going on the train. Yeah. So, yeah, so we've got eight, so we all covered. Okay. Um, Byron, thank you very much. Uh, you would make Mr. Scanlon proud, and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm proud of you. So, <laughs> thank you very much. we have no confidential items this evening. Do we have any committee remarks? Being no further business, Councillor Brene. Yeah, sorry, uh, <laughs> Councillor. Right, all right. Councillor Chair, um, through you to the CAO. So time flies, they say, when you're having fun. So January the 24th, um, the three communication uh, teams within West Niagara, Grimsby, and uh, West Lincoln, Grimsby, and Lincoln put out a communique to talk about a potential uh, naming that the three mayors had uh, submitted to HHS in April of 2023. The memo went on to say that it was crucial that a decision be made by March 1st because the board, the HHS board was meeting on February 27th. A number of things took place and we were able to get the HHS board to uh, give us uh, a deferral to their May meeting. So now 10 weeks has gone by, uh, we're now into April and uh, we talked about uh, the awareness of the potential name change and given an opportunity uh, for all council members to be engaged, equity seeking communities to be included in the discussion and the surrounding community uh, have an opportunity to provide feedback. I'm wondering after 10 weeks if you could uh, bring us up to speed because obviously this council has not had any uh, discussion so I'm just wondering um, what has transpired over the last 10 weeks and what can we expect to trans transpire between now and the time this goes to the HHS board? Thank you, Chair. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will provide um, a quick update for members of council. Uh, over the last two months, give or take, uh, both HHS and primarily HHS as well as the comms teams uh, have been working together, uh, have been sharing information, uh, have been doing, I know HHS is engaged in some polling that they've been doing uh, in terms of seeking consultation from, from the community. Uh, there is a final meeting this week between Hamilton Health Sciences uh, and the communication teams. Uh, I've asked that the CAOs be included in that um, and we can share more information next week. There will be, as I said, further communication coming out once we can coordinate with Grimsby and West Lincoln uh, and once the public engagement uh, closes. Uh, we do anticipate coming to council. In what format we're coming to council, I can't necessarily um, address that because we're not sure yet. We really wanna have the meeting this week. There have been some ideas thrown around uh, and, and talked about, uh, whether that be a, a public tri-council meeting, whether it be individual meetings at each of the uh, respective councils, uh, those are all on the table and so I will be in a better position uh, to provide that update once uh, the communications and uh, Hamilton Health Science, once the communications teams and Hamilton Health Sciences meet this week, uh, of which the CAOs will be a part of. That meeting's taking place on Friday, so as soon as I know, uh, I'll make sure members of council know, but I think everyone remains committed I shouldn't have said I think, I will reiterate, everyone remains committed to making sure each of the councils in some format, uh, whatever is decided, have a chance to weigh in. Okay, and I just wanted to remind committee too that, that when we ask for committee remarks, it's pertaining to the agenda as per the meeting that we're dealing with. So it's not our favorite free for all, that used to be new business. Now, 
I gave you a little leeway there, Councillor. So with all due respect, Chair, I did uh, talk to the CAO in advance, and he suggested I bring it up this evening. So that's something that you as a chair can speak to the CAO about. Thank you. Okay, because I was unaware of that, and I'm getting kicked under the table from the clerk. So anything like that, uh, someone would please give me a little briefing. With all due respect, I think it's my prerogative to ask for that and to be given a heads up and not to be, you know, something come out of the weeds because we're trying to fo follow procedure. So I'm being, I feel like Gumby here being pulled in two directions. So just give me a heads up next time. So no further pieces of business. I call the meeting adjourned 10-10.